Hey, it's Tim here. I'm super excited about this video. This is a Tableau desktop crash course. Yes, I promise you that if you watch this video from start to end, I'll make sure that you've gone from zero, absolutely no understanding of Tableau whatsoever, to a dashboard published on Tableau Public or Tableau Cloud, and I'll string everything in between. We cover the different license types, Tableau Public, Tableau Desktop, how to install them, how to use them, the interface, building the basic charts so you know how to get started with those as soon as you have access to Tableau itself. And we'll even talk a bit about some quirks and some tips and tricks that I think are fundamental for users to have right out of the gate. This is, I think, one of the best starts to Tableau that's available anywhere for free. And it's also made me wonder, what would a full-on Tableau course covering the entire platform made by Tableau Tim look like? If you're curious, stick around to the end. As ever, let's get stuck in. Right, today we are learning Tableau. Let's switch over to this view. So let me just check everything is working okay. Uh, yeah, we're learning Tableau. What is Tableau? Um, if you haven't noticed, let's do some housekeeping first. On the left of the screen is, is literally my notes that I'm going to be working through. So if you're already keen and you've sort of been looking at the left-hand side, this is sort of the rough agenda for the crash course. And, and it's quite long. And my promise to you is that I will not leave this chair until this is done, okay? <laughs> so we are gonna get this all done. Um, this is being recorded. Uh, that's the nature of YouTube. So uh, don't worry too much about, uh, you know, grabbing notes, grabbing screenshots. You can come back to this later on. I might do some editing on the recording, but nonetheless, this will be up pretty much within 48 hours once the stream is done. Um, the agenda is pretty straightforward. Because this is a crash course, there will be things that I'll touch on briefly, but I'll call them out. And I'll call them out for two reasons. Number one, I've been on YouTube a long, long time. So, you know, if I just go to uh, my videos, I guarantee you that most of the things I've done in the course today, there'll be a video about in my uh, library. So for example, if you want to learn how to do calculations, you can just come on the channel and search for it. There's, you know, if you just search, you know, Tableau Tim and the topic, you pretty much find it. So whenever I call out something uh, that I've done a video on already, just go to my channel and search for it. That will cover it in more depth. You know, I often spend five, maybe 20 minutes covering that specific detail topic. Where there isn't something, I'll cover it in detail here, of course, as well. So just, just, just be aware of that. Okay, so let's get started. So welcome, and um, welcome to this crash course of Tableau. Um, I'll quickly do a very brief introduction of myself. Um, I don't think you guys need an introduction, but I'll do it anyway for the benefit of the recording, just literally one minute. My name is Tim. I'm a analytics consultant. I, I am also a LinkedIn instructor. So if you head over to my LinkedIn profile, you'll see that I recently introduced this uh, course called Everybody's Introduction to Tableau. If you actually go to my profile and find this post, I'll put it in the comments, um, you can find a link just underneath this uh, blue area that says saved. And if you click on that link, you'll have access for free for 24 hours. So that's something to be aware of. I'll put it in the chat now, just so you can see that. And then, um, yeah, very last thing is I'm a Tableau visionary. So I've been I've been working with Tableau for eight years now, a uh, really, really long time. First time I used it, I didn't even know I was using Tableau. That's why it's eight and not seven. Um, and yeah, I'm part of a, a, a very a privileged community of people who help teach and uh, you know share the values of Tableau, but also help spread the good stuff that Tableau can do, whether it's at work, whether it's for good causes, or whether it's just trying to get more people to be more data literate and work with uh, Tableau itself. So that's pretty much a um, summary of what I do. And hopefully I'm going to be able to share some of that uh, wisdom with you today. So let me go ahead and close these tabs as I no longer need them. Okay, so what is Tableau? Tableau is a analytics platform. It's essentially um, a tool that's used in businesses to help them work with large amounts of data and help teams and analytics teams build analytical workflows. Now I'm pretty proud of a, uh, if you go to Google and search what is Tableau, I'm pretty proud to essentially have a video that covers this topic in under 10 minutes. It's got over half a million views and so what I don't want to do is labor that uh, here in the uh, live stream. But what I will do is I will um, I'll put a link to this in the comments in the chat as well. And this is definitely probably the best explainer of Tableau I've ever done. I'm due to do a new one. I don't know how I'm going to beat this one, but uh, join the <laughs> half a million people who've already watched this 
and who think it's a great uh, introduction to Tableau. For the benefit of everyone in this stream, um, it's uh, a really, the, what, but the, the simplest way to think of Tableau is in every business, you work with data, whether it's how well you're performing, what you're selling, um, what you want to do, goals or targets. Um, as your business is transacting, doing whatever it needs to do, um, you're collecting data. And what Tableau offers is a platform to manage that data, store that data in some respects, and then share that data with people in the organization. It does that using a range of products, and each of the products has a different role in the entire platform. So if I go over to this tab over here, I won't go into each page. I just want to give you a rundown of the products. You'll see that the platform is actually made up of several products. Most people know of Tableau Desktop, but not many people actually go beyond Tableau Desktop, which is a real shame in my opinion, because the whole platform is super powerful. So today, we're just going to be covering Tableau Desktop, uh, this option over here. There's another product called Tableau Server, and recently a new product called Tableau Cloud, which was previously called Tableau Online. Now, Tableau Server and Tableau Cloud, they're responsible for essentially playing the role of the platform. They're the platform that you connect to, they're where you share your work to. They're also the platforms that manage things like governance and uh, the ability to share stuff within your organization. It's essentially a CMS for analytical content, whether it's a dashboard, data, um, security, data connections, all of that is managed inside of the Tableau platform. Of course, businesses have other tools as well. So Tableau plays really nicely with those tools. But in essence, Tableau Cloud and Tableau Server are where people go to mostly consume that information. The work that you build in Tableau Desktop gets published up to Tableau Server and Tableau Cloud. It's essentially like putting up a blog on a website. And uh, once you've done that, other people can see it and all the security and permissions are managed, which means your data stays safe, it stays governed, and in many cases, it allows you to uh, also do things like monitor which data sources are being used and which ones aren't, so you can better optimize the way data works. Um, Tableau Prep is a fairly new tool. It's a data preparation tool, very similar to another tool in the industry called Autrix Analytics. That is another uh, tool that's used to clean data. Now, when we're talking about cleaning data, most of you maybe do this in Excel. You might do it just manually by you know, changing the way data looks. Maybe you're pivoting rows in Excel. Maybe you're creating power pivots to reformat data. Tableau Prep lets you do that in a visual way. And again, for that product, I actually have another video that explains that really, really well. So again, I won't, I won't sort of Google that now, but if you go to uh, Google and search what is Tableau Prep and you look at the first three video hits, my video there will explain that for you really, really, really well. The newest part of Tableau recently is something called CRM Analytics. This is essentially what used to be called Einstein Analytics that sat within the Einstein platform in Salesforce. In essence, before Salesforce acquired Tableau, Salesforce needed their own analytics platform, and that's kind of where CRM analytics came from. So I won't delve too much into that today, but that's just some context. Tableau Public is actually pretty important for today because although I'll be using Tableau Desktop and I'll occasionally switch to Tableau Public, Tableau Public is essentially the free version of Tableau Desktop. So everyone watching this video now doesn't need to pay for Tableau or even activate a Tableau Desktop trial just to try Tableau. You can actually start using this straight away from Tableau Public. And again, I'll show you this a little bit later on. Once we've gone through all the products, you have uh, these items here at the bottom, which I won't go through in detail, but in essence, uh, these are add-ons. There are additional capabilities that are added to Tableau to allow you to do different things. So data management helps you manage data better. Advanced management helps you run Tableau Cloud and Tableau Server in a more optimized way. Embedded Analytics allows you to take your Tableau dashboard and put it inside of another application. An application in this case could be inside of your CRM. It could be a portal that you have inside of your organization for managing patients or managing people or managing whatever you manage. Um, and in other cases, it could just be uh, the ability to give someone the ability to build a dashboard using data from your system. So embedded analytics is a sort of abstract concept, but in essence, you're just taking the technology that Tableau have built and you're putting it inside of your own application or your own platform. And then they have a bunch of other integrations and stuff that I won't go through. But that is, in a nutshell, what Tableau is. It's an analytics platform. It's got quite a big you know, uh, handful of tools now. And they all sort of work to this purpose of helping businesses better manage data. Now, 
I've explicitly been mentioning businesses because Tableau is an expensive product. You know, it does something that's really important for businesses. And so if we just very briefly go to the pricing, it's always important to talk about pricing because licenses are linked to pricing and licenses control what you can do with Tableau. So if you're going to install Tableau desktop on your machine at work or wherever you're going to have it, um, if you're using Tableau public, great, that's free. I'll come to the limitations in a second. But if you're using Tableau Desktop, you're going to need to understand where your Pacific organization has put you in terms of licensing. So if I go to the Tableau pricing, you'll see uh, three terms that are commonly used for licensing. The first one is a Tableau Creator. The second one is a Tableau Explorer. And the last one is a Tableau Viewer. Now, these are <laughs> very sort of abstract terms, but I like to sort of break them down and simplify them. And so what I would say is a Tableau creator gets access to the full platform. If you're using Tableau desktop, you're using Tableau prep, you have the creator license. Now, back in the old day, this used to be called something completely different. They didn't have these names. And so you might still see a few people using Tableau with a license key specifically just for Tableau desktop or specifically for Tableau desktop and Tableau prep. But broadly speaking, if you're new to Tableau today, you're going to be either a creator, explorer, or a viewer. For the benefit of everyone else, an explorer and viewer are kind of the same. These two users essentially just access data on Tableau Cloud or Tableau Server. You can see here it says uh, Tableau Cloud. I should start using my annotations. You can see here it says Tableau Cloud. And the reason it doesn't mention Tableau Server is because there's an actually a second tab here that shows you the pricing for on-premise, which is Tableau Server. I won't go into the detail of the difference between on-premise and hosted by Tableau, but just know that Tableau Server hosted on-premise is a little bit cheaper because your organization takes on the management of uh, basically managing the server. Tableau Cloud is just like Salesforce, is just like any other tool like Google where you log into a website and it's all managed for you. You don't have to worry about servers or systems. Everything sits in the cloud. And so there's an additional cost for the Explorer and Viewer license to be able to do that and not worry about setting everything up. The Creator's license automatically works on Tableau Cloud and Tableau Server if they already have one. And as I mentioned before, you've got these add-ons here at the bottom, and uh, these pretty much control additional capabilities, but that's a bit beyond sort of the, the, the basics for this, for this course. So um, to use Tableau Desktop, you're going to need a Creator license. Now, what if you just want to learn Tableau? What if you just want to use it for free? Like, how, how do you get how do you get a get, how do you get your hands on it? Well, the first way is to start a trial. I think the trials are normally two weeks, so you can you know start doing something serious and start to understand how it works. They do take your details, and you might get a call from Salesforce within minutes. But nonetheless, you can ignore the call, just get learning, and get stuck in with learning what Tableau can do for you. Except for the trial will run out, and you'll get stuck. What people don't often know. This is another part of Tableau, which sits on a separate website, but is also running in the cloud called Tableau Public. And that's what I have on this tab. And Tableau Public is essentially a good way of learning Tableau without having to pay for Tableau. And you might think, well, that's really, really strange. So what are the limitations? Well, the limitations are that you can only connect to certain data sources, and I'll show you this a little later on. And you can only save your work to Tableau Public. It doesn't mean that the work is always public. It just means that you always have to save it to the cloud. It's a bit like only having the ability to save files to Google Drive in the cloud. It's exactly the same sort of concept. Tableau have their own storage platform that stores all of this work and creates this wonderful gallery where you can go and see what other people are building with Tableau. And they're using the exact same version of Tableau that can do what you can use Tableau for at work. So in terms of learning Tableau, you can install this at home, you can play around with data sets that you're more familiar with, and you can learn everything you need to learn because the real only limitations is the ability to connect to a database and where you save your work. Of course, you're not gonna be saving your work work on your laptop at home. That's not gonna be something you do if you decide to try a Tableau Public, but it's a very, very good platform, okay? So that's the difference between the two. Tableau Desktop and Tableau Public are virtually the same and they work just as you'd expect, um, for pretty much the same way. The only difference is desktop is a paid product, uh, public is free with limitations of where you can save, what you can connect to. Everything else works pretty much exactly the same, okay? So, any questions so far? Let's let's stop there, because I've, I've not covered Tableau versions, but I think I've covered what is Tableau, and I've covered the Tableau platform. Hey, 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 S sorry, sorry to break your flow, but I just need a quick favor. 
you see uh, this button right here, it's called the subscribe button. I'd really appreciate it if you just smashed it. So just, just hit it right now, just quickly, quickly, and we'll get back to the course. Done, thank you, thank you so much. Let's carry on. Um, and I've covered the licensing. So any questions so far on those topics? I'll just give you a couple of a couple of seconds just to uh, you know <laughs> let me know in the comments. Meanwhile, I'm going to go and strike out the things that I believe I've covered. If I haven't covered these, you guys can hold me honest and and let me know. Um, but I'll try and uh, I'll try and keep it simple. This is a crash course. I also have to keep keep things <laughs> moving as well. Okay, um, so I'm not seeing anything in the comments. So what we'll keep doing is we'll keep push, pushing on. The very last thing to be aware of before we install Tableau or do anything is what version of Tableau you're using. You see, Tableau like to make things complex with all their innovation by creating new versions of Tableau every quarter. Essentially, you'll get one in March, you'll get another one three months later and so on and so forth until the end of the year. And then every single month, you'll get what are called patches. These are small updates that improve the previously released versions. So the best way to show you this is go to a website that I don't even know what it's called. The way I get to it is actually quite funny. So I searched this term that used to be a term that was only ever used, I think, um, as of five years ago, but it still works. So I, I type into the search bar Tableau, E-S-D-A-L-T. I have no idea what that means. If anyone knows what that means, let me know. You can see it's actually here. Um, alternate download site. I don't think that is it. That is it. That can't be it. But when you get there, you can see all the releases of Tableau. And to me, this is the best place to understand the different versions. Because on the left, you can see the paid products. You don't have Tableau Public here. Tableau Public is downloaded from the Tableau Public website. But you get Tableau Desktop, Prep, Server, Online, and Bridge. We're just focusing on Tableau Desktop. And so you can see here, you have 22.4, which was released in December. 22.3, which was released, let's go down here and have a look, October. And as I expand these, you can see that there's actually uh, other versions in between. And this is what I meant by patches. You see, in June here, for example, when they released 22.2, it was working fine. And then customers get in touch with some issues. And then in August, a month later, they update it again. And they keep doing that even as new versions are getting updated. So if your organization is using an older version of Tableau, let's say you're using 21.3, you still got an update back in December of 2022, just last month. And so it's really important to make sure that in your organization, you know what version your organization is using and you make sure you stay in lockstep with that version because it just means everything is going to work swimmingly. You won't design something with a new feature and then find out you can't share it with people because you've published it to a server that doesn't support that feature. And that leads me to the next point, which is each of these uh, pieces of software are upgraded individually but the features within them occasionally need to be used for the same version. So let me give you an example. In the most recent version of Tableau, they released a mapping capability called the intersects function. I just released a video about it. Now, if I used 22.4 and built out a dashboard with that feature, but then my server, which is an on-premise server, hadn't been updated to 22.4, you can see that that doesn't exist yet. I'll explain why in a second that feature wouldn't be visible to end users once I've published it up. In fact, when I go to publish it up, the server would tell me, hey, you're going to have a problem here because I've seen this feature is not available. And so you're probably wondering, well, hey, you just said that the features are updated every quarter. What about Tableau Server? Well, as of 2022, Tableau stopped updating Tableau Server every quarter. Instead, they only update it twice a year. So they update it in January. So we're about to have the next update very soon. And they update it again around about summer. So you can see uh, when when did this come out? October, not even, not even summer, end of summer, basically. So you get one in January and one in summer, which isn't great. And so this has been a big change and it's caused some challenges in some organizations. But just be sure that you still get patches. So even though they might not be updating Tableau Server, with new features every um, quarter, they still update them every month with fixes and patches. So it's still worth doing these updates so things run stably. Some organization might sort of forget to do that because of the less frequent updates. And so the key thing to remember here is that whatever version of Tableau desktop you're using, you need to make sure it's working with the same version of Tableau Server or Tableau Cloud. The other thing you won't see in this list is Tableau Cloud. 
And because Tableau Cloud is run by Tableau, it doesn't need a download. You simply go to a browser. In this case, let me show you my Tableau Cloud instance. And if I uh, go ahead and log in here, Uh, oh, I forgot my password, so let's try again. When I log into it, everything is available here immediately. When I install software on my computer and I sign into the server, everything will just work. There are no upgrades required, and I can just go ahead and use it. Tableau Desktop, the latest version will work happily with Tableau Cloud if you're using Tableau Cloud. So if you're using Tableau Cloud, update as often as you want. It's always going to be up to date. But for Tableau Server, just wait until your organization does the update, okay? What I'll do is in the edited version of this video, I'll put a graphic up that explains this a little bit well, better even. Um, so just be sure to uh, look out for that as well, okay? So let me go ahead and scratch that off my list. Uh, we've done Tableau versions, we've done licensing, we've done the platform, we've done explaining what is Tableau. Now let's look at desktop and public, okay? Now, to download them, uh, Tableau Public is a little bit funny. Um, and I'll, I'll start with Tableau Public first because that's the version that most people can go ahead and do right now for free. There's two ways of using Tableau Public. Um, the first way is to use it here in the browser. The second way is to download it. Now, most people will tell you to download it. And if you want to kind of simulate an experience that you'd have at work, I would say also go ahead and download it as well. That's the best way to actually experience it. And if I go to the Create dropdown up here, select Download Tableau Desktop Public Edition. It takes me to a page. Uh, it asks me to sign in if I'm not signed in. And if I click the button, uh, it always asks for a few bits of information. This is just marketing. Uh, I can never get out of this. But go ahead, install, um, put, put your details in here. You can put like a um, like an alias if you want to and download the application. That will allow you to download the software for Windows and Mac. Once you've done that, run the installer. There's nothing to set up other than just literally clicking OK, agreeing with the terms and conditions and letting that run. And then once you've done that, you're pretty much good to go. You'll have the software ready to run. If you want to use it in the browser instead, if I go back to the home page, all you need to do is go ahead and sign in. So let me go ahead and do that. And once I'm signed in, you'll notice that I actually have a profile. So my profile uh, picture is just up here. If you're new, I think it walks you through the experience a little bit. And once you're signed in, what I actually encourage people to do is don't, don't go and try and build something straight away. Do something a little bit more crazy, which is go find some of the trending visualizations right now. Uh, Priya Padam here is a colleague of mine at the Information Lab. So if I actually go to her visualization right now, any visualization which the author has made available to download, if you go to this button just right here, you can actually open it here in the browser and start to edit it straight away. So I can go ahead, click on that button, make a copy, and I'm immediately in the web editing experience for Tableau Public. And actually, this is the same way of editing experience you get for Tableau Desktop if you use it in Tableau Cloud or in Tableau Server. And check this out. I can even go into the visualization. I can open it up. And I can even see exactly how this has been built. This is just such a powerful capability. And so this is how easy it is. Uh, we've, we've been streaming for such a short amount of time, but I've already shown you how you can get free access into Tableau just by using Tableau Public to go and see how other people are using their visualizations. Now, granted, this is a little bit intimidating, okay? We've got a lot of uh, things going on here. But later on today, we'll actually build this exact chart we won't have it looking as nice as prayers done here because that formatting takes a bit of time. So this, we're not going to do that. There's no time in a crash course, but we will build this map um, with these circles and I'll show you how to do all of that. And everything here should look a lot less intimidating by the time we're done. Okay. So let me just go back and close this. Uh, if you want to know what I'm doing, I'll just try and annotate it a bit more. I'll go ahead and close this up here at the top. And I don't want to publish this because this is not my work and I don't want people to think it's my work. It's Priya's hard work and uh, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so if you want to go ahead and create anything, you know, go ahead, edit something. But you can also just go to create here at the top, select web authoring, and it takes you to a blank canvas. And the blank canvas is great because you can then go ahead, upload the data from your computer. If you've got a text file, a CSV, Excel files, these are all possible just through this. Okay. Now, that's the web experience of using Tableau Public. What about the desktop experience? How do you go ahead and install uh, the software uh, on your machine? Well, you go ahead and download it and install it. And then once you've done that, 
what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to swipe over to my Windows machine because I have my Windows machine just behind my desk and I'm remote desktop into it. And over there, I actually have the different versions of Tableau already running so you can see the difference. So the first thing I'll do is open up Tableau Public. You can just install the software and when you've done that, you can see it just becomes available to you to install over here. So you can just go ahead and click on that and you're pretty much good to go. And when you open it up, you're met with this interface. And this is actually the classic Tableau interface when you open it up for the first time. Whether you're using Tableau Desktop or Tableau Public, it's all the same. On the left-hand side, you have what's called the connection pane. The connection pane allows you to connect to data. In the middle, we have the open pane. And this open pane is a bit different in Tableau Public because um, what it shows you is some of your most recently worked on work. It's a bit like your recent documents in Google Drive or on your computer. The other thing that it also shows you is some of the work that you've pinned. So once you start to do a lot of work, you can actually pin them to this location so they're always visible as well. And then very lastly, the last thing we have on the right-hand side is the Discover pane. This Discover pane uh, essentially links you to a couple of things. Um, some getting started resources, which are just covered here at the top. Uh, these pretty much show you how to use Tableau. They're going to be, hopefully, just as good as my tutorials, uh, if not better, because the people who put them together make the products. So hopefully they'd be, um, you know, much better. You have a link to Visit the Day. Now, we've just, we were just on Tableau Public. Visit the Day is essentially a visualization that's been voted as a community favorite or has been selected to be showcased for the community on that day. And sometimes they come through here in the product. And the very last thing is resources. So these are things like um, the Tableau blog, uh, sample data sets you can get stuck in with, and the current status of Tableau Online and Tableau Cloud also available there. So sample data sets is really good because it's a really good way of understanding how everything works and you can sort of bring it together as well, okay? So that's the interface. Now, you're probably wondering, well, how is this different from Tableau Desktop? And this is actually the best place to show you the big difference, okay? Uh, when I go ahead and select more, you'll see that I get only three options here. So if I wanted to connect to a database such as, let's say, Microsoft SQL Server, or I wanted to connect to something like uh, Snowflake, that's not going to be available here because Tableau Public is limited. It only lets you connect to uh, flat files, which are these files here at the top. So Excel, text, JSON, Microsoft Access, PDF, spatial files, and statistical files, essentially any file on your machine. And then the servers it lets you connect to are Google Drive, OData, and Web Data Connectors. Essentially, these are basically other places where you might store some of these flat files and or web data that just doesn't make sense to put behind a price wall because you know, Tableau doesn't build those connections. So that's the limitation here initially with data connections. If I go ahead and uh, close that option, the other limitation is if I go over, let's say I go over to the data tab, you'll see uh, you'll see that I have very few limited options up here at the top. And when we go over to Tableau Desktop, you'll see that you get a much bigger range of options. And one of the things you can't do is save to your desktop. So if I click on this little icon here on the very top left hand side, let me just uh, highlight that a bit more. When I click on that icon, what it does is it switches to the visualization building uh, setup essentially. And that allows me to see the full range of options still in Tableau Public. But now if I go here and try and save the document, it's not gonna let me save it to the computer. So here, it only lets you save to Tableau Public. So that is the limitation of Tableau Public in this particular instance. It's not going to let me save to my desktop machine. That said, if I go to server, it will, um, it will show me the options that I would expect to see, but in order to save this anywhere, I'm always going to need to go back here and select Save to Tableau Public or Save to Tableau Public As, which allows you to rename the file or you know write over an existing file. So those are the core limitations of Tableau Public. Everything else works exactly as you'd expect. There are like some tiny, tiny quirks. For example, the behavior with Google Docs is slightly different in public versus desktop. Again, that's an intermediate thing. We don't need to worry about it, okay? So that is Tableau Public, and I'm gonna go ahead and click on this little Tableau icon in the top left again to go back to this window. The only reason I'm clicking there now is because I haven't connected to any data, so that's the way to switch between the windows by just clicking that icon on the top. Right, let's switch to Tableau Desktop and show you how that's different. So let's go ahead and go down to Tableau Desktop, which is just over here. Now, immediately, you can see there's a lot more going on. 
uh, in my connection window on the left, we now get the full breakdown of things you can connect to. So we have the files that we had before. These are just here. We have the server-based connections, and we also have what are called saved data sources. And saved data sources are just things that have been saved for convenience. They're not necessarily uh, data sources that kind of get, you know, uh, organizations can put in, in that folder for you. It's essentially just a, an easy place to put things you work on very frequently, a bit like your desktop, but you can put them there so they're very easy to access. So we'll, we'll talk about that maybe in an intermediate uh, session instead, but don't worry about them today. Um, the server-based connections are a lot broader. So you'll definitely see that this list is a lot more impressive. And the thing to point out here is that you might have seen that a few of these loaded once the window opened. So these options here loaded once the window had opened fully. And that's because these actually live on another part of Tableau called the Tableau Exchange. Think of it as like a marketplace, except for right now, everything is free. So it's kind of like a weird marketplace where everything's free. At some point, they're going to start selling something. So for now, these are all free connectors made by these companies and or Tableau, and you can go ahead and use them alongside all these other connectors. So I'm pretty certain you'll find your database in this list. If you don't find your database in this list, what's most commonly used to connect to those databases is sometimes uh, ODBC or JDBC connector. Essentially, it's a uh, open source way of connecting to certain data sources using a certain protocol. And uh, the other option is the web data connector. If it's web-based data, you might instead use a web data connector to connect to those sources. But pretty much everything else is going to be in this list. And if it doesn't exist, well, um, typically either someone has built an ODBC connector or there's going to be a connector down here that lets you connect to it. So pretty much everything is covered. Okay, so let me go ahead and minimize this list because it's quite a daunting list. And to be honest with you, most people, when, when you open Tableau first time, don't try and connect to a database. Just connect to the sample data source that's being given to you. We'll get to that in a second. If I go to the bottom, you'll see something called accelerators. Now, I don't know why Tableau tries to confuse people, but accelerators are just templates. Think of them as pre-built dashboards that you can use to uh, you know, accelerate your work. Essentially, someone's done the work for you, so you don't have to. Except for the fact that these three dashboards here were never built with that in mind. These three dashboards are actually sample workbooks. The best way to think of these sample workbooks from a, let's say from a professional perspective, is there are a good benchmark for understanding how things should work in Tableau when it comes to speed and performance. So if you open one of these three workbooks, let's go ahead and do that now. I'll open up the Superstore workbook. If you click on them, it opens them up in another window. If you open one of these up and your laptop or computer is really struggling to work with these uh, specific dashboards, it probably means your laptop or computer isn't appropriately specced. And that happens really rarely. But if these are slow, your whole experience is going to be slow. But if these are working fast, they're interactive, they're working quickly, you're clicking on them and things are happening like you'd expect a normal tool to work, then things are working pretty well. Now, right now, this is taking a bit longer because I'm on an M1 Mac and you know everything's a bit weird. Actually, no, this is on Windows, so it's just taking longer. I don't know why. <laughs> but um, this should just work. So for example, when I hover over these uh, data points, I should get nice, fast tool tips. When I click on them, the whole visualization should react. Um, you should get a nice sort of snappy experience switching between the tabs. And of course, we haven't published this up to the browser, but if you were to publish this to the browser, generally speaking, you should be seeing roughly the same sort of performance. So that's why these are a good benchmark. Again, I don't want to confuse you too much by clicking around and doing a bunch of different things. I just want to show you what to expect when it comes to performance and load times and how things should work, okay? Let's go ahead and actually close this because we don't, uh, I've actually ended up uh, opening this again, so that's fine. What we'll do is we'll keep this open for now. We'll keep it here. We don't need this window for the next step. But if I go back to the connection window, just by clicking on that icon again at the top, you can see that we have the accelerators still here on the bottom. And uh, you can now see we have an item here in the open pane. Now, when I hover over it, you have this uh, little pin icon that you can click on. It's really, really small. I'll try and highlight it here for you right there. That keeps this workbook in this position. So essentially, this won't move uh, anywhere. If anything gets opened, that will always stay on that top row. If you have a lot of them, you can arrange them as well. You can move them around uh, just to sort of get things nice and tidy. Now, if you want more templates, you can go over to this right-hand side and select more accelerators templates. 
And when you do that, you'll actually find that there have been some dashboards that have been made that already try and answer certain questions. And actually, just like we did with Tableau Public, where we went to find different dashboards you can work with, here you can go and find dashboards that you can actually use at work that connect to things that you might be familiar with. For example, Salesforce. Uh, maybe you're in a finance team and you want to go and see what other corporate finance teams are building. The only word of caution I'll say to you is that some of these dashboards have been built by, you know, people, everyday people in the community that build fantastic work. And you can tell because they look really, really good. And some of them, let's just say that the jury's out on whether they look good or not, but the work that's been done on the connection has been fantastic. So they are set up correctly and you can really generally trust how they've brought the data models together to support the visualizations that you want to build. So if I, let's say I, I want to search for a dashboard that talks about a wealth investment or insurance broking. So let's go ahead and search insurance. Uh, I can't type, so let's go search insurance. Insurance, can I, is that actually correct? No matching content, insurance. I can't spell, can I? Let's just type this, let's type in sure. No, no, no matching content. There's nothing on insurance. That's so weird. Okay, let's go to corporate finance instead and just look at what's here. So the most recent one here is this executive KPI dashboard uh, by Bistry. I actually know who built this, uh, but it's a really, I think it's a really nice dashboard. I think it has actually been, this is one of the sort of um, better aesthetics that you get on the on the uh, Tableau Exchange. And this one's actually customizable. You can click on it and do a bunch of stuff with it, download it and use it. And uh, it's got a how to use page and everything. So you can really kind of do some awesome things with it. If I scroll back up and I go back, let's let's find one more. Uh, let's go back here. Let's find one more. Um, let's just go back down. Let's go see what else do we have. These are all a little bit a little bit strange. Let's go somewhere else. Let's see if well we we do have an insurance section. I don't know why it wasn't coming up in the search. If I scroll down, um, I'm going to looking for these ones because these are the ones, the information I built where I work. So of course I'd look for them. <laughs> so let's go uh, look at this insurance underwriter uh, performance. I also know who built this. this. is a colleague of mine called Ellen Blackbird, uh, Blackburn even. Um, her work is fantastic. She's just really got a great eye for design. And these are dashboards that really excel at showing you what's possible with Tableau. So if you want to use these, absolutely get stuck in and get involved. Anyway. I'm here to teach you how to use the tool, not how to use templates. So the very last thing is the Discover pane on the right-hand side. The only way this is different from Tableau Public is we have a little bit more of a training section, slightly longer list of resources, and you often get updates from Tableau Marketing on the bottom right. So you can actually uh, sometimes see things like conference announcements and so on and so forth in there. Now, if you're really sort of advanced in your organization, it is possible to change this whole right-hand side section to point to a web page instead. So in this right-hand side section, you can actually point to a specific page in your organization. And so you can put information for people who use Tableau straight away. Maybe it's guides, maybe it's information about who runs Tableau, uh, status updates, all of that can live on the right-hand side of that. And again, I've done a video explaining how that works and it's really, really good to see, okay? So um, I think we have done what we need to do on this interface. I'm now going to switch back to my Mac so we can actually start working with some data. So let's go ahead and go back and make sure we cross off what we have covered and what we haven't covered. So we've covered Tableau Desktop and Tableau Public and just the difference between the two of them. We're about to start get, uh, connecting with the data. So let's go ahead and strike that. Um, a note about installation. I think I've already covered how to download them. The installations are pretty straightforward. The only thing worth noticing here is um, whatever version you downloaded and installed last becomes your default version. So it is possible to have multiple versions of Tableau on your machine. This is for the purpose of upgrades. If you've just upgraded to a new server and you'd still like to have the old version around so you can check things work correctly, that is an important step. So if I uh, grab, let's grab my applications folder here. Let me just show you this. I typically have the last two versions of Tableau. So you can see I have 22.3 and 22.4, 22.3 and 22.4 for Tableau Prep. In Windows, uh, it's exactly the same. Whatever you last installed becomes your default version that's installed on your machine. So bear that in mind. If you want to make it a default version, let's say you want to make an older version the default version, you need to kind of run the installer again and that will become the default version on your machine. Otherwise, just pay attention to what you're opening and closing and make sure you don't make that mistake like I have done sometimes, okay? 
So just bear that in mind. Um, uh, Parvin, for your benefit, the recording, this is YouTube, um, everything is recorded, so it will be available. So don't worry about that. I just saw your comment at the corner of my eye, so I thought I'd cover that. So that's the only quirk with installation. You can install multiple versions. The latest one you've installed becomes your default. If you want to make an older version the default, install it again. Simple as that. Right. Um, let's go ahead and cross this out. Okay. Finding the right documentation. Generally, the last thing I want to cover. You would be amazed how often people do not know where the documentation for Tableau is. Because I think most people assume that documentation is generally poor, but Tableau documentation is exceptional. It's really, really good. It's one of the things I'm worried about with all the layoffs at the moment, that that will probably be one of the places we do see things get worse, because it's the kind of thing that only people who pay attention really go to. So if I go to tableau.com, and I'm going to show you this just from the Tableau website, because I think it's just this is just so important to know. You go to the resources tab, and if you go to support and you go to Tableau help, it takes you to this page. And this is the Tableau documentation. The thing to pay attention to is that over here on the left-hand side, you have the version. So remember earlier on, I talked about being aware of what version you're using. This is an important thing to bear in mind because if you change the version on this left-hand side, it changes the documentation to the right to match that version. And so you want to make sure you're looking at the documentation for your version because you might go find the version uh, that talks about a different operating system or a different uh, sort of technique because you're using it in the browser versus desktop. Just make sure you're looking at the right version. Once you've selected the version, you'll see that the right-hand side updates. You can expand any of these and each of them get a full link to the full documentation along with a bunch of other resources. Now, if you're a real geek like me, you can just go ahead and click into all of these. And it's great because it not only tells you what's new and how things work, um, it actually breaks down everything you ever need to know. The very final tip, I'll give you this, I'll give this tip to you for free. When you've clicked into the right version of the documentation, if you go to the search and then search for a topic, it's only searching in that version for notes. It's not searching across all notes. It's just searching in that version. That is such an invaluable thing because so often people will go, uh, if I go back to this page, they'll go to this very top search uh, bar here, which searches everything in Tableau documentation. And that often tends to return the latest version. And many people aren't on the latest version. Most organizations tend to be one or two versions behind. So they're actually often, well, they're not always reading the wrong documentation, but if something small has changed in that version, they could be reading the wrong instructions because there's something different that's changed. So that's how to find the correct documentation. If you're going somewhere where there's not going to be internet or where it's unreliable, grab the PDF and save it in Evernote, save it on your phone, and you can search the PDF instead. Um, I do this. I'm a consultant. I have an offline version of uh, these saved in my note-taking tool. And essentially, I can go in there and search that, and that searches inside of the PDF for me, and then I can get the notes. But, you know, the internet is pretty good nowadays. We don't have to worry about offline notes too much. But, yeah, that's how to find the right version of the documentation and just make sure that you know how to use it accordingly. Search, control, find on the page, and you're pretty much good to go. So let's go ahead and cross that out, and let's get actually stuck in um, with this, uh, session. So here, this time I'm on my Mac, just for everyone's benefit. I'm on my Mac and, um, everything looks exactly the same. Maybe sort of Mac specific things are on this particular page. And you can see that I have this connection pane on the left-hand side. Okay. And this connection pane is pretty important because depending on what you're trying to connect to, you need to go to the right section to select that file. For argument's sake, let's say that I want to connect to a CSV file, like a text file with some information in it. I can go ahead here and select text. And what it will do is it'll open up my, uh, you know, connection window, my file window, sorry. And you'll see here that at the bottom, it's looking for these types of files. So if you're not sure what type of file Tableau is expecting to find when you select an option, you can just go down here to the bottom. And on Windows, it's pretty much the same, but it just looks like a Windows interface it will tell you what files it's looking for. And that's why these are all grayed out because none of these files match the criteria of this list. And that's essentially what you need to sort of look out for. Now, how do you know the file extensions for these things? Well, it's just a little bit of experience. Like Excel is .xlsx or .xls or whatever. Whatever Excel has been over the years, that's what it's going to be. That's a very well-known uh, file format. Text files on the other hand are a little bit, a little bit broader. You can have .txt, .csv, .tab, .tsv, 
TSV is tab separated values. CSV is comma separated values. Um, and it goes on and on. Okay. The JSON files, now this is a web optimized format. So you can see here, it's only looking for one specific file. I'm looking right here. If you're wondering where I'm looking, I'm just looking uh, here where it says a JSON file. Um, that's one specific format. That's uh, known as JavaScript object notation. I think that's what, no, JavaScript. Yeah, it is JavaScript object notation. And um, what that means is essentially it's data stored in a specific way, typically from web-based systems. So if you go and export something from an internet-based system, and you just ask for the raw data, typically it will give it to you in JSON. So you can connect directly to that as well. If I hit cancel, you can connect to PDFs. Now this is a bit hit and miss, the PDF scraping, you know, it's got a capability built into Tableau that uses um, a scraper that goes and looks into the PDF and tries to find the data across multiple pages. Um, but it can be hit and miss, it's not always reliable. So try it, if your PDF has data, you think Tableau can grab it, try it first. You might save yourself a ton of time copying and pasting, but if it doesn't work, then yeah, you might have to resort to something a little bit more advanced or simpler, just copy and paste yourself. Spatial files are uh, quite an interesting addition to Tableau. They've been in Tableau forever. I don't know why I say addition, but um, they can be connected in sort of a couple of ways. Now, spatial files uh, are typically this whole range of uh, files. I won't go through each and every one of them explaining them. The ones you're typically going to see used commonly with Tableau are these Esri shapefiles, .shp, GeoJSON files, which can come from web applications like Google Maps and so on and so forth. And then you've got um, KML files and um, a couple of other files that sometimes come out of uh, similar systems. So KML, KMZ, um, you might have this MIF and .tab as well. Those are very specific. And then zip files typically also contains uh, spatial data within them as a package, and that's why it comes as a zip file. So Tableau is able to sort of work with all of that. And that's why here you can actually see that it's highlighting the files it can see. So all this time I've been going through the files, it's not been capable of connecting to them. Here you can see that it's happy to connect to these two files. So let's go ahead and find some data to connect to. Let's go ahead and um, to do this, I'm just going to go to a website and try and find some data. I wanted to give you sort of an honest experience of connecting to data that you just found on some sort of website. So I'll go to Kaggle. Kaggle's really, really good. Um, it's gone to a data set that I used a long time ago. So let's go back and let's go to the data sets tab and uh, we'll try and see if we can filter this. And you can filter by specific file types. Let's just select the CSV and hit apply. And you get sort of a list of different files. Uh, I'll connect to this top 100 Spotify songs. This looks pretty good. Um, and you can get a little preview of the data. So let's go ahead and download this. Uh, it, looks, it looks pretty small, but let's go ahead and download it anyway. Oh, I need to register. All right, let's go ahead and sign in with Google. And once we've done that, uh, I should be able to download this. Let's go ahead and do that. And yeah, I'll save it to my desktop just to keep things nice and easy. Once it's on my desktop, I'll, I'll show it in the finder and I will uh, unzip it. Okay, so now that it's been unzipped, let, where, where is it? Where is it gone? Uh, let's see, where is my, where has it put the file? Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, well, though. it's not, it's not, doesn't seem to be showing up. Let's click out and click back in. Right, let's try this. Let's just, I'm pretty sure it's on my desktop. So let's just go try and find it. It's a CSV file. So if I select text file and I go to my desktop, uh, you can see here, there it is, a list of most streamed songs on Spotify.csv. And if I just click out of it, you can see all these other files don't match that criteria. That file does. I select open and you go into what I call the connection interface. Now, let me just give you a quick overview of this interface. The connection interface is broken into what I call three sections. You've got the preview section on the bottom. The reason I start with the preview is because people always want to see something familiar first. So this is where to go to see your data that you've just connected to. You get a, a list of the, uh, of the field names on the left-hand side of that preview pane. So you can see what that is as well. And then on the top, you have what is called, I'm going to call it the data modeling window. This, oh, Siri didn't like that. So let me take my watch off so it doesn't try and interfere with the live stream. Um, this is called the data modeling window. And in this window, you can essentially uh, build data models and work with your data. I'm trying so hard not to get into really advanced topics. So bear with me, but I'll explain what a data model is very, very briefly in a second. You don't need to worry about it. 
And on the left, you have what is essentially a list of your connections and the resources that you can bring into your connection and use. Okay. So what is the workflow for connecting to data? Well, as soon as you connect to data, the first thing you should look for is what is the connection called? This is essentially going to match the name of your file. And if you want to, you can change this. Uh, the easiest way to change this is just to double click here at the top and you can uh, change the name. I'll call this Spotify, uh, Spotify, hit enter, and you'll see that that changes, but it's not going to change the actual name of the file that I'm connecting to. Yeah. So the name of the connection is changed up here, but it's not going to change the name of the file that I'm actually connecting to. That is always going to be the name of the file. And once I've connected to the file, just below it, I'll highlight this in red, you have essentially the different things that can be in that file. So when we connect to an Excel file soon, you'll see that this is slightly different. But here, I've just got this one file here that you can see, list of most um, uh, listened to songs on Spotify, which is essentially the file, the CSV file. And then on the bottom, I'll highlight this in uh, green, you have essentially a couple of new features. So you have the, the union, which allows you to bring data together. We won't cover that today. That is, again, it's not really an advanced topic, but it's just not sort of pertinent in this particular uh, sort of crash course. Um, and then the new table extension, which really is advanced. We don't, don't, need to, don't need to worry about that at all. But very briefly, this allows you to use um, analytical applications to bring in data from other systems like Python and R to bring data alongside your normal data. Okay, so that's the left-hand side of the connection window. Now, when you've done that, let me go ahead and remove this. When you've connected to your window, you see when Tableau automatically does something for you when you connect the first time, it goes ahead and brings something into this space for you. And as soon as you drop it down, you get the preview we saw before. So in essence, when you connect to something for the first time, it's already done for you. And so you're probably thinking, well, what do I need to do? Well, it's already been done for you. It's right here. But if you don't see that, or if you want to bring in a second item, what you need to do is just go ahead, grab the file and bring it in and drop it in. And now you get a preview. The other thing is you might want to see your data in a sort of more spacious window. And if I hover over the file, you can see there's a little tiny box that appears just here where I'm highlighting. It's disappeared because I'm not hovering over it. But now if I hover over it, you can see it's right there, this little tiny uh, table icon. And when you hover over it for long enough, it says view data, you can open it up and go ahead and view the data. So if I just go ahead and drag this out, oh, it's not letting me drag it out. There you go. Now let me drag it down. No, nope, it's not going to let me drag it down. It's going to let me drag it out. That's absolutely fine. I won't complain. And it shows me the data. So essentially, you've got one, two, three, four, five columns. Okay. Now that I'm here, it's important to notice a couple of things that Tableau has done. Firstly, it's gone ahead and looked at our data and understood that each column represents different types of data. So types of data just mean numbers, text, values, and you can see that it's calling this one ABC, this one ABC, and this one ABC. Essentially, it thinks that these three columns contain text, okay? Now, we can see that this column here contains dates, so we're gonna need to correct that. We'll come back to that in a second. The other thing, though, is that if this column here called rank, it's seeing contains numbers. And you can see it's got a little hashtag for numerical values. And the same again for streams in billions. So although this number says 2059, I'm not sure if this 2059, I don't know if this is 2 billion and 59 or if this is 2059 billion. I hate this kind of stuff. I think this is 2 billion streams. We can go on Spotify and have a look, but I'll just assume this is 2 point something billion streams, okay? So all of that information is called metadata. Metadata is essentially information about data. It's essentially the core information that tells you what is in your data, and you can then use that metadata to make sure things behave the way they should. For example, numbers should be treated with numerical values. Text should be treated with text behavior, text values in essence, okay? so. How do we change these? Well, if I close this preview window, you'll see that just over here on the bottom, let me just bring this pane to the left. I have the same preview that I've just seen, but it only shows me the few uh, hundred, hundred rows. I know that because it says a hundred rows right here. So if I set that to a thousand and hit enter, it will show me a thousand rows. Um, it's still showing me a hundred rows. I don't know why. <laughs> it might be a bug on my Mac version, but it should show you whatever number of rows you type into that space. Now, when I go to this column here at the top, you can see that I can actually click on these as well. 
So let me go to the date column here, release date. I'm just going to tell Tableau, look, can you change this to another data type? And when I click on that, I get all the data types that are available. So I get number, whole numbers, date time, date, string, spatial, Boolean. These are types of data. And if you're not sure what these are, go ahead and just Google them. They're pretty straightforward. Literally, once you know them, you know them. You don't need to learn them again. But they're pretty straightforward. In this particular case, I know that this column that I can just see right here, when it says 29th of November, that should be just a date. There's no time. There's no like uh, 29th of November at midday. It's just a date. So if I go ahead and click date, Tableau does something very smart. It goes and processes all that text and tries to make sense of the date. And because Tableau is good, it's actually gotten very good at that, that I'm confident that it's got it right. So you see here, it says 29th of November, 2019. I'm in the UK, so this is the correct way of doing dates. <laughs> don't 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 come at me if this looks completely wrong to you. This is the correct way of doing dates as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so uh, now it's changed that to dates. You can see that we have a calendar item right there ready to go. And uh, this has been understood and everything's going to work nicely. So we can go ahead and start using this in our visualization. Now, if I wanted to bring another data set in, I could. But again, this is a crash course. We're just going to work with single data sources for now. Um, I've done many videos and other people have done many videos about how to bring two data sources together. When you're doing that, you're typically doing something called a union or a join. Uh, and if you're working with Tableau, there's also this new concept called a data model. I've also done a video on that. So go and research that. But for now, assume we're connecting to one data source. We've got one connection. Everything is set up nicely. Now we're ready to visualize our data. What we can do is we can just go down here and Tableau's kind of telling you this the whole time. Go to this step to go to the worksheet and start visualizing something, okay? So when I go ahead and click on the space where it says sheet one, we're into the building window. We can actually start building a data visualization, okay? And now I'll go through this in a second, but I wanna show you a couple of other ways of connecting to data as well. So that's pretty much the flow for connecting to data. Now, let's say you want to go back to the data connection window. You maybe realize that something is wrong and you need to change the file. Well, you can do that at any point. Just because you've started building the visualization doesn't mean you can't change what you've already connected to. So to do that, you just want to go back to this data source tab here. So if I go ahead and select that, it takes us back and we're pretty much golden. We can just start uh, changing everything again. We can rename it, work with it, but everything's going to work as you'd expect. Uh, it's going to be pretty straightforward. So that's essentially the first example of connecting to a file. We connect to a text file. We're ready to work with it. We're ready to visualize it. We can kind of put a put, put a nib on that, bow it off, and say we know how to connect to text files. Okay. The next file I want to show you is an Excel file. And Excel files are the most common files you connect to in Tableau. I hate to say it. People should be using databases, but Excel is just so common. So this is what you're going to have to connect to. So how do we connect to that? Well, I'm going to show you how to do that, having connected to one connection already. You see, if I go back here and I start trying to add a connection here, Tableau is going to get confused because it might think that we want to bring the data together. We want to kind of put these two files together. I don't want that at all. I want a separate file in my workbook to work on a separate visualization completely. So how do I do that? Well, if I go back to sheet one, let's say I've built a visualization, you can see that here at the top, I have a plus icon next to a cylinder. Now, a cylinder is typically the icon they use for databases pretty much everywhere. If I go ahead and click on that, you'll see that I get the same window that we got when we were connecting to data at the start. So that connection window, it also lives here. Essentially, you should be very familiar with it. And this time, I'm going to choose the Microsoft Excel file. Okay. When we choose that, I want to go over to my documents folder and I want to make you aware of a folder that Tableau installs on your machine in pretty much every case, unless you work in an enterprise organization where they've decided to take that file away from you. <laughs> and it's called my Tableau repository, this folder right here. Now, this repository file comes with every installation of Tableau. And if you double click it, you'll see that it actually has a few things. It has some sample workbooks has logs. If you ever have an issue with Tableau, this is where it will drop them. It has data sources that you might have saved, and it has a bunch of other things. Okay, One of the things I like about this is in that folder, you should have a, another folder with the version of Tableau you have installed. Now, I only have 22.4 on this particular setup, so I'll go ahead and double click that. And then I'll go ahead into that file and I'll look at the English 
version of the data sources that I have. And you should also find in your version of this folder, in your documents folder, this file here called eusuperstore.xls. Now, this is a great file because it allows me to show you something. And I know for a fact that you should also have this file. If you don't have this file, I'll put a link to this file in the document so you can find it. The thing to note, though, is that depending on your version of Tableau, these files are different. So if we start visualizing something and you see a slightly different number, don't worry. We've all got the same data source. It's just that they change them from version to version. They maybe tweak a number here, tweak a number there. Sometimes the totals don't quite add up, but generally speaking, all the sort of columns are the same. So just follow along with columns. And as long as it looks the same, you're in, you're in good company. And we've got two versions of the file. We've got a European version and American version. Because most of the YouTube audience is American, I'll go ahead with an American audience. Um, the second biggest country on my YouTube channel is India. There is no Indian version of this. Maybe we should make one as a nice little side project. Let's make an Indian Superstore version with Indian locations that are more specific to the Indian market. Maybe we should do that. Uh, let's go ahead and select the sample file, select open. And when we do that, Tableau thinks about it and it takes us back to the connection window. So you're probably thinking, well, hell, hold on. Last time we had the CSV file, where has that gone? Well, it's not disappeared. What it's done is it's created a new connection. And the new connection allows you to basically switch between this connection and the previous one we made with the CSV file. And if you just go to this top little drop down, you can see that the one we renamed, if I just go here, you see the one we renamed previously called Spotify is right there. And if we click on it, we go back to it. And if we click on this cylinder again and go to the new one we've just connected to, which is an Excel file, we go back to that. So you can switch between all these different connections just right here, okay? Now, if I go back to the Excel file, you'll see that it says right here that it's an Excel file. Let me change to my red annotator. I prefer that one. Now, we've selected this Excel file, and in the Excel file, it has three tabs. If you're familiar with Excel, we have tabs across the bottom. You have... Uh, well, you just have tabs. It depends on what they are, but each of them could contain information. And so what Tableau is telling me is that, look, this file contains three pieces of information. It has an orders table, a people's table, and a returns table. And if I'm not sure what they look like, I can, of course, remember, I can go ahead and preview them just by clicking on those, and I can see, ah, oh, this data actually contains information about orders made at my Pacific store. Let's go ahead to the people table, connect to that. Also good. Uh, returns connect to that. Also good. So this is just allows us to look at the data sources and understand what's going on. Okay. Now, you'll notice that as I connected to each of those, these icons changed. I don't know if anyone noticed. If you don't believe me, rewind and look at the icons again. These icons have changed and they've gone to a green uh, square with a little sort of tag. And the tag lets you know that this data is actually coming from a named range inside of that Excel file. If you're not familiar with name ranges, I've done a whole video on this. So go ahead and look at the video where I talk about name ranges and Tableau. I talk about this in a lot of depth. But the key thing here is that when you're working in Excel, in fact, let me just go to Excel and I'll show you. If I go to Excel here, I have it open. If I say uh, make a table, uh, let's make a, oh, my cursor's not working. There we go. Let's make a table of uh, uh, fruits. Um, I've got my annotator on as well. So let's go ahead and say apple and pear. Okay, and I could say this costs uh, 10 pounds, very expensive apple, and this costs five pounds, okay? Now, that's a piece of information, that's data. Now, if I highlight these, okay, and create what's called a named range, if I just go to the data tab, just up here, and I can never remember how to do this. Where is the named range options? Da, 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 uh, the, the actual easier way to do this is just to go to the home and uh, format it as a table, which is, where is the format as a table options? My God, I'm really bad here. Well, I found the name range options instead. I, I can't get this dark mode version of Excel. Um, it's just clearly throwing me off. So <laughs> if I select the table, select the fine name, you can see that it tells me the name range here. It's just pointing to that sort of square. If I select OK, that becomes a named range. And that is essentially what we have. You can see here the named range is called Apple. And it starts with this row, and that is essentially going to be visible in Tableau as Apple when I connect to this Excel file and start working with it. So that's what a named range is. And uh, people use them in organizations all the time to sort of section out data where you have multiple things on an Excel page. That's essentially how to connect to each and every one of those individual tables. And if it doesn't exist, you can go ahead and connect one, and it allows you to pick out data from a page 
full of information. Okay. But for now, uh, what I really want to look at is uh, orders. So if I just scroll up, you can see that we have the orders uh, view over here. What actually happened with this is the icons didn't change. I scroll down. That's what must have happened. This interface is... <laughs> what is happening with Tableau interfaces recently, honestly? So this never used to scroll down. This just used to move down to make space for it, but it's deciding to, to scroll. So it didn't change icons. Anyway, here's the orders table. To bring it in, we just drag it in, like I said, showed you before, and we get the same preview as we've had before. Our data is here. It's pretty good. We can customize any of these as well. We can do anything we need to do, and it's pretty much good. Now, the final thing I'll show you is that there are some data prep capabilities in this window. If I go to this little drop down, you can see that I have the ability to split and do custom splits, essentially break out the data and in some cases, even pivot the data if I need to do that. So in this case, if I just select split, Tableau looks at that column of information and it automatically splits it out into three columns. You can see here at the very end, it's added them in. And a little clue to let you know that those have been created here is that if you look here at the very, very top, just in this section, you'll see that these have a blue marker and these don't have a marker. The blue refers to this blue over here. So when you're connecting to multiple things, they might have different colors and those colors will show up on the columns to let you know which table they've come from. That's basically it. Okay, so that's why you don't get a blue icon here at the top because these have been created inside of Tableau rather than just in general. So now that we've done that, we're pretty much good to go. We can go ahead to sheet one as Tableau hints us to. So I'm just going down here, selecting sheet one, and we're back here, ready to build some data, ready to work with our visualization, and we're pretty much good to go. Uh, if I look here on the top left, I now have two data sources, Spotify and Superstore, and that's pretty much everything you need to know about that, okay? The very last thing I'll show you how to connect to is a database. So you've connected to a flat file, you've connected to Excel. The last thing I'll show you is a database. Databases are pretty common at work, so it would be a pretty bad tutorial to, to show, not show you that. So let's go ahead and connect to a database that I have access to. Now to do this, I need to be super careful that I don't share my credentials on the screen. So let me, just give me one second, um, that I just don't give you all my information to my database and I make sure that I have it in another window and I can type it in uh, uh, appropriately as and when I need to. So let me just, where, where is this? Um, where have I put this data? Honestly, I should be more organized. Here we go. So I think, I think we're okay. One thing I'm slightly concerned about is that I might have security settings on my database to stop me connecting because I'm not where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Long story short, for security reasons, um, sometimes it's good to tell your database not to let you connect from certain locations because those aren't locations you're supposed to be connecting to the data. So for this, what I'm going to do, I'm going to move this. Can I move this window to another window? Yes. I'm not going to show you this until I filled it in because I don't want you guys getting all my database details. So let me fill it in off screen. Apologies, this is probably the worst, this is the worst uh, live streaming uh, thing to do, but you can't dynamically um, fade out stuff. I trust you guys won't be stealing my email and everything, but I need to just be able to uh, log into this database and do that. So all I've done is I've typed in the credentials. Now, I've actually done a video on how to connect to Snowflake, so you can go watch that video where I have blurred everything out. But as soon as I connect to a database, you'll see I get a different kind of window. It's not like what we've seen before. Um, for Snowflake specifically, I get what's called a warehouse. And each database has its own sort of setup. So you might get different things in. You might have like a warehouse, but the warehouse means something else. You might have a data lake. You might have all of these terms. You might have schema as well as an option that turns up in here. Depending on the database, they're all slightly different. This follows the terminology of that database. So I'll go and select my warehouse. In Snowflake, warehouse just means how much computing power you want to use. So I have one called Compute. This is my own database. I use this to run this YouTube channel and everything that goes on with uh, my channel. And then I've got a demo database, a Tableau demo database with demo Tableau data. So if I go ahead and select the, that, that works. Then I can go ahead and select the schema. This is the public schema. And in the public schema, you can see that I have three pieces of information. I have my employees table, my invoices table, and my orders table. This is all dummy data, so there's nothing sensitive here. 
my orders table, I can preview it just like I showed you before, and it looks exactly the same. So these options are just slightly different because I'm connecting to a different type of data source. But if I go ahead and close this, you'll see I also get an option to do custom SQL. Now, if you're the kind of person who just knows how to write their SQL to connect to a data source, you can actually go ahead and just bring that in and paste your SQL in here, and Tableau will go and run that query to return the data that comes back and use that in here. The advantage is you could do a lot of data preparation in this window, but a note about custom SQL, it can sometimes slow Tableau down, especially if you're using a live connection. So just, you know, use it with caution. And the other nice thing is with custom SQL, you can insert a parameter that's controlled by the user that actually runs in this window. So if you've got a live connection, you want to give the user the ability to choose some sort of variable from the database. So your database is just not chucking everything out the user. You can actually use a parameter in this window to do that. That's just worth noting. But nonetheless, same as always, drag my orders table in. It looks exactly the same as we've been using before. Uh, table there, preview at the bottom, ready to go. Go to sheet one, exactly as you'd expect, connected, okay? So we've got three connections. We've got our Snowflake connection, we've got our Excel connection, and we've got our CSV connection. All three of them are up here at the top. Now, you're probably wondering, well, great, let's start visualizing our data. Let's start working with this um, information. Well, the tricky thing is actually we're not done. And let me just sort of take a break to sort of check what I've covered here. So the connection interface is done. Let's strike that out. Finding data to use, I didn't really cover that, so I'll come back to that. Connecting to data, I kind of feel like I'm doing that now, so I'll cross it out ahead of time. And yeah, the next thing we're going to come to is the Tableau extracts. So you see, the, the, the easiest way to explain this without going into too much detail is that Tableau extracts are an optimized format of data. Right now, everything we're connected to is connecting live. The way I know that is that each of these cylinders are just cylinders. So these are all live connections. What does that mean? That means every time I do something in Tableau, Tableau is actually going to that file and querying the information. Every time I do something with this particular connection, it's going to Snowflake, querying the data and coming back. Now, that's fine, but if you're trying to build a dashboard at work, that's actually not fine because what happens if the database goes down whilst you're building something? What happens if um, you just want to build something quickly and you don't want to worry about the latency and the networking issues in your organization? You just need to get on with work. And so Tableau has another way of capturing this, which is essentially by taking a snapshot of the data. What it does is it goes off to the data source, it takes a snapshot, but it remembers where it got the data from. And when it takes that snapshot, it means that it saves it into a more optimized format that allows you to do a little bit more with it. And it also works considerably faster. It's also a lot smaller. So a good example, if I took like, a, let's say a 200 megabyte CSV file, like a text file, Tableau would compress that down to about 10 megabytes, much, much more portable, much faster. It's gonna be much faster than opening a text file and looking through it and querying it for information. And the added benefit is that extracts also allow you to do certain things that you can't do with just normal connections. Um, again, it's a little bit beyond the, the nature of this crash course, but you can do a little bit more with it. So how do you take an extract? Well, there's a couple of ways. Um, if I go back to any one of these, uh, in this case, let's go back to my Excel file. I can right click on it and I can select edit data source. When I do that, it takes me back to this window. And I wanted to show you another way of coming back here just so that you know that you can do that. Okay, now up here on the top right, you can see there's an option that says extract. I completely missed this before because I wanted to wait until I was here to kind of talk a bit about this. And you can see the default option is live. But what I'm saying is you should be using an extract, okay? And so let's have a look and see what happens when you switch over to the right-hand side. You see, when you go to the right-hand side, it says extract will include all data. It's not created the extract yet. It's just telling you that this is going to include all data if you were to take one. But here's the advantage. You can change what data comes in. You can change what data comes into your snapshot just by selecting edit and Tableau gives you this window that allows you to choose what data you'd like to bring in. Don't worry too much about the stuff here at the top. All you're paying attention to is the filters pane here in the bottom. Okay. When you select add, it shows you all the columns in your database. So let's say I only want to bring in cells from a specific subcategory. I could go ahead and select okay. 
choose that subcategory, select OK, and now I've limited my data to just the art data for my extract. I've not deleted it from the database, I've not deleted it from the file, I've just brought in a tiny sample of that data because maybe this is all I'm analyzing. If I select OK, that's all fine. And now when I go back to my visualization to start using it, Tableau actually asks you, hey, where would you like to save this extract? And this is kind of confusing because you're probably thinking, like, whoa, 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 I thought you were going to save it in the workbook uh, in this particular file and you're not going to take a copy of my data. But in actual fact, Tableau does need to write the file somewhere. It likes to kind of write the file. So I always say to people, look, save it to your desktop because we're going to delete this later. I'll show you why. Save it to your desktop. And when it's done, you know you have an extract. When you go to the top left hand side here, and it has two cylinders with an arrow going from the first one to the second one. Essentially, it's telling you that it's taken an extract and now it's using that extract, okay? And so if I go and ask Tableau, hey, what subcategories do I have in my data? I'll just go ahead and drag subcategory onto text. You'll see the only data I have in that file is art. But if I wanna connect back to the live data, let's say the database is back up and everything is great, I can go back in, right click, untick the use extract option and all the data comes back, okay? So just by switching that on and off, I can switch between whether I'm using my snapshot or whether I'm not using my snapshot, okay? Now, the other reason people use this particular extract feature is because they're only interested in a small part of the organization. And uh, other people use it to optimize the way they build their workbooks. They wanna make it go faster, they wanna make it easier. And so again, that's a really great way of doing that, okay? So that is an extract in a nutshell. There are definitely more I could talk about with extracts. There's definitely more you can learn. Go ahead and Google the topic, look on YouTube. I've done videos, other people have done great videos on this and um, go ahead and check them out. In the recorded version, I'll maybe put up some links to some resources that I think are fantastic that I've not made, other people have made, that I think you should check out, okay? Great stuff. So we've created an extract. We could do the same with this first one as well. And this is another way of creating an extract. You can just right click the file here, select extract, and you get the same window. This time here, rather than in the connection window, you could add a filter. In this case, I won't. I'll go down to the bottom right, select extract. It will ask me where I want to save it again. I hit my desktop, save. And you'll see that this extract has a different time zone to the underlying data. Essentially, Tableau is looking at the metadata to understand, hey, what's going on here? I'm fine with this. I know this is fine. I'll select then show again, click OK. And again, we have an extract right there. So pretty easy, pretty simple. Now, at this point, this is when I start to save the work. Okay, I don't want to go through all this effort making connections and then forget to save it. So. If I click on Tableau and I go to file at the very top, I can go ahead and save as. Now, if I click save, it will just go ahead and open this window and it will want to save it in my Tableau repository. I don't want it in my Tableau repository. I want it on my desktop. So let's go ahead and select my desktop and you'll see it gives it a name called book1.twb. I'll call it live stream. Okay, giving it the file live stream. Now, this file extension is super important. So many people make this mistake, so pay attention, okay? A TWB file is just known as a Tableau workbook. At the bottom, there's another type called a packaged workbook, okay? And the packaged workbook not only contains your data visualization, but it also contains your extracts and any data sources, as well as assets like icons and images. Those all get packaged into a TWBX file. And so most people, I think, generally want to save everything in one file. They don't want to save it in lots of different places, then have to go back and find it and relink it, especially if we're about to delete the extract from our desktop. We just want to go back here and save everything in one file. So if I go ahead and select that, we're going to save it as a TWBX file, hit save. It will go ahead, save it. I know that's saved because here at the top, oh, just the annotator's kind of gone in the way. <laughs> here at the top, you can see it's called live stream. And now that's saved, okay? And so what that allows me to do, if I find my um, uh, uh, little icon, is I can go ahead and I can now safely delete these two because they are actually now in my workbook. They've been saved as a package workbook. If they weren't saved, it would just save a TWB. And the next time I try and go and do something, it would still be connecting to the local files. And it would basically have a panic attack because it's saying, hey, 
I had extract. They were on the desktop. Where have they gone? And so to fix that, the only way you can kind of get those back is to go back, connect to the original data source and regenerate the extract. Essentially, this option here, there's a couple of options sometimes here you can use to regenerate the extract, refresh, re-update. Tableau will kind of give you a hint as to what it needs to do. Uh, but that's where you find these sections. You can m mess around with these uh, options, you know, figure out what they do, Google them, whatever. But we won't cover that in much detail. Go check out the videos on extracts that have been done by the community. Okay. And now, even though I've got my extract in my workbook, I can though go ahead, right click, untick use extract, and it brings everything back in. Because what it now does is it goes to find the extract, realizes it's not there, then goes to the main file and brings all the data in. If I go ahead and extract the data, this time removing my filter for subcategory and bringing everything in, select extract, we take the extract. You're probably wondering, why am I repeating extract? It's because people don't get it. <laughs> so just want to make absolutely crystal clear that you understand what extracts are, OK? The very final thing, you can see a tick mark on the data source that I'm currently using, OK? If I go to another data source, you'll see that I don't get that tick mark because I haven't brought anything in and everything goes orange. If you're into that zone, you're, you're skipping way ahead. Just go back to the data source you were using, select that, clear the sheet, just removing everything. Or if I go back one step, there's a back button right here. If I go back one step, you can just go ahead here and select clear the sheet. That will clear everything. And now when I switch to another data source, that blue tick isn't there and nothing's changing orange, okay? You just want to make sure you don't get confused. This is exactly what happens to people, and they get so confused, and they realize they're creating blends and joins. Oh, it gets crazy. So make sure you're working on the data source you're supposed to be working on by just making sure you clear the sheet or you create a new sheet if you need to, okay? So that is an extract. I've covered extracts in pretty, pretty good depth, okay? Now... The next thing to sort of touch on is the interface. I mean, come on, I've gone right into Tableau and I've not shown you any sort of interface whatsoever. So let's go ahead and actually explain this interface a bit more. I'll move my annotation tools out of the way. Let's put them in the middle of the page because then they can't really get in the way, okay? So you've connected to Tableau. At the very top, you've got what I call the toolbar, okay? The toolbar has a bunch of different things. Often you'll see me go into this toolbar throughout today I'll even forget to just mention that I'm going there because for me, it's muscle memory. I've just sort of gotten used to going up there and doing different things. It's got some of the most commonly used things that you do with Tableau. If you hover over each one of them, it tells you what they are. I don't want to go through each and every one of them, but essentially you've got the back and forward button, okay? The, the back button in Tableau is very good. Like it, it will go back as far as you need to, pretty much since you've opened the file. So be very careful how far back you go. Really make sure you go to the right step and don't undo your work and then start doing something and then lose the sort of forward history that it's actually built up. You've got a couple of other options. You've got the data connection window. You've seen the cylinder. We've got the pause button. Don't worry about the pause button just yet. Uh, if you're working with really large data sets, research what this button does. Um, you've got the sheet option. So clearing the sheet, copying the formatting. All of that is up here. You've got the ability to rotate charts, some highlighting, grouping, formatting, uh, views, setting the screen to fit different sizes. All of that is up here. We'll cover it as we start to go through the session. <clears throat> now, the left-hand side is called the data pane. Now, the data pane has, surprise, surprise, your data. And each of the columns in your data sits on this sort of um, left-hand side pane. And you can remember, we had these icons that basically talked about different data types. Well, those exist here too. If I just highlight them in green, all the data types are right there. And you can hover over them and look at them, or you can click on them and change them if you believe they're wrong. The other thing is you will see that Tableau split this data into sort of two arbitrary groups, and some are blue and some are green, okay? Well, this is nothing to do with the types of columns they are, okay? People often make that mistake. They say, oh, it's because... It's the difference between, um, you know, dimensions and measures, which is what these are actually called. So these are typically called dimensions in blue, and in green we have measures, okay? That is actually isn't the reason why. Uh, you can have a, uh, a dimension turn into something like a measure. For example, a date can both be a dimension and a measure. You can have 2020, the dimension, the actual year, 
and you can have uh, 2020 as a time scale, as in a line that becomes continuous or a measure, essentially. So, in essence, um, let's not let's not get into that just yet. Well, when we look at dates, we'll go into that into into more depth. Okay. But the thing to note is, obviously, when you click on each one of these, you can uh, change the data type, and you can even, um, it's actually not letting me do that. Why is it always coming up with a geographic role? That is really bizarre. <laughs> what is going on today? Look at this. That I swear that never happens. Normally, you're able to change this. Okay. So there's obviously some changes going on in Tableau. Either I'm just, if I'm just completely out of um, kilter, but... Previously, when you clicked on this, you could change the data type, okay? Now, if it's not letting you do that, you can actually go down into this option and change the way it works. You've got default properties, you've got different things. Depending on what the field is, you can obviously go down into this little triangle and you get a whole bunch of options that let you change what it does, okay? And this is pretty much consistent with every single field. Whatever field I hover on, you'll see this, this little tiny arrow. Let's see if I can isolate it. Now, I can't isolate it because it disappears when I hover over. But this little tiny arrow on the right-hand side of each pill as I select it gives you more options. And in those options, you can change a bunch of different things. Okay. Now, the power of that is if you realize something's wrong, you can change it. The other thing you can do is if you realize something wrong, but you're not sure, I always recommend right-click on one of these, duplicate it, and you create a second item. Then you can try whatever you need to do with the second item but you're not going to break the main item. Essentially, what Tableau has done is it's created a calculation. We'll go into calculations a little later on, but you can see here that it's got a little equal signs next to the ABC. That means it's a calculation, okay? Now, the other pane that you probably don't realize is there is called the analytics pane. You can just see it here. I'm highlighting it in green at the top. And when you switch to it, you get some of these um, aggregation types and the ability to add things like reference lines and some of the statistical models as well. We'll come to this probably in another stream, but in essence, the only time you really want to be using this is if you're using reference lines. We'll touch on this today, how to use them and what are the options, but we won't go into a lot of depth. So we're just touching them briefly. I'll show you where everything is and then we'll kind of skip along. Okay. And then after you've sort of looked at this left-hand side of the data and the analytics pane, You've got the bottom section, which is essentially where the data source and the sheets live. So all the sheets, all the dashboards, you click through them here on the bottom. On the very, very, very bottom, you can probably see here that it's my name. Uh, that's essentially me logged into Tableau Server. Um, and that's why that my name is coming through there. And then uh, over here in the middle, you can see that I have uh, two, well, three things. The pages shelf, the filters shelf, the mark shelf. The two things to pay attention to are the filters, essentially allows you to filter things like you would in Excel, and the marks pane, which controls charts. We'll come to that very soon. And then on the top, I'll highlight these in red. You've got columns and rows. This is an important thing that controls charts in Tableau. And the very, very final thing is you've got the canvas. Here you can see the whole general space that's this um, sheet one, sheet two. That's just here in the middle. And those are pretty much all the areas. So when I refer to columns, rows, shelf, uh, filter shelf, marks shelf, those are the things I'm referring to. I'm referring to these sections of Tableau. You can move them around. Uh, for example, if you want the marks pane further up, you can do that. You can bring the page yourself here at the bottom. Totally up to you. Uh, you don't have to leave them as is. Most people leave them as is. I, I, I leave them as is because you know, I do tutorials, so I want them to stay the same. But broadly speaking, and um, that's where everything is. The last thing, which I hate using, I hate people using this, not because I think you shouldn't, but because people use it as a crutch. And I think if you learn Tableau, you shouldn't need to use this, but show me. Show me allows you to understand how to build charts. The problem is most people end up basically using it forever and always getting it to build their charts for them, okay? So that's the interface in a nutshell. That's everything you need to know. Everything I'm going to be calling out will be in these areas. When we go to a new interface, I'll keep showing you the introduction as well so you can understand it. But that's pretty much it. That's everything in one go. Okay. So I've covered the main interface. Now, the last thing I haven't done is finding data to use. This is a bit, it's a bit of a topic slightly out of out of kilter. I don't know why I put it there, because I should have put it at the end or something. But um, the common places to find data sets, actually, if I go back to Tableau Public and I go to the Resources tab, you can get the sample data. And here they have a list of businesses 
and sample data that you can get started with. So if you're just learning, this is a really good place to just go and find some assets that you can use straight away and just, you know, ignore kind of all the hassle of having to, to clean the data, whatever. Everything is just good to go. This is a really good place. The other place is, of course, Kaggle. Kaggle is great for um, sort of openly available data sets and everything that you can kind of go to that the community is talking about. People like to sort of dump data sets on there. So that's a great place to go and find something that you may be passionate about and start working on it. The other thing is, if I go back to Tableau Public, you've got um, these community challenges and resources. And um, let's let's see if I can find these. So if I go to the, let's go to the Tableau community page, well, not Tableau Public, Tableau community. Um, Tableau community, wrong place. Uh, mm, hmm. Mm, no, this is not what I was looking for. Uh, if I go to this page, this page is on the Tableau homepage. Um, you can find community projects. There you go, community projects. Uh, and in the community projects, there are a couple of projects that give you data sets to use on a weekly basis. So Makeover Monday, run by Andy Kriebel, um, uh, allows you to do that. I think it was Andy Kriebel and Eva Murray. I think they're both doing it again. Uh, it's gone through sort of different hosts over the years, but I think it's Andy and Eva at the moment. Workout Wednesday, started by Andy, but I think hosted now by a bunch of people from the community. This is basically a weekly challenge where you can download a data set and then they try and give you something to recreate in Tableau. And then you can see how it's done. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, you can just look at the answers. If you do know how to do it, you can kind of give yourself a challenge of figuring it out. Um, and then there's a bunch of other uh, sort of opportunities here. I won't go into all of them, but all of them are fantastic. They're really, really good. And I think uh, they're a great sort of learning resource for understanding where to go and find data that just allows you to get into Tableau. Some of these are not Tableau specific either. Some of these have data sources and data sets for other tools like Power BI. If you're into SQL, some of them uh, challenges do get done in SQL as well. Uh, I'm not in that sort of world, so I don't know too much about that. But nonetheless, you can go and find great data sets from these places. The other thing is the internet. The internet just has lots of different data sources that you can use as well. So that's pretty much a good thing to go to. All right, let's go ahead and strike this out. Right, how does Tableau work? Well, I fairly the interface. And this is a very difficult question to answer, but I'll answer it by telling you how the technology behind Tableau works, okay? When Tableau was created, the biggest innovation about Tableau was how it allowed any user to work with data without having to write SQL. So if I go to Sample Superstore here and I drag category onto rows and I drag sales onto where it says ABC, you'll see that I get the total sales for each category. The innovation that Tableau made was that I didn't need to know SQL to create that query. But of course, if I'm connected to a database, obviously something needs to be right in the SQL because databases only work with SQL. So here's how Tableau works. If I go to the help menu and start a performance recording, it's a bit of a random place to go, but uh, let's just, just bear with me. If I start a performance recording, Tableau starts basically recording what's going on in the background. And now let me drag, uh, let's drag subcategory onto rows. You'll see I get a list of subcategory and let me get sales and put it on columns instead. You see where I dragged it changed the behavior of Tableau. It built me a bar chart. And now if I stop the performance recording, go back over to the help tab. I don't know why it's under help, but let's go ahead and stop the performance recording. You'll find that Tableau shows you what was going on in the background. Wait for it to load. There it is, it's coming up. And here's the secret. If I just drag the slider and I just go down to uh, this, executing the query, when you drag and drop things in Tableau, what it's actually doing is writing SQL for you in the background and sending that to the data source. That's it. That's essentially the core innovation behind Tableau. It's giving you a visual interface to run SQL. That's why the IP, the technology behind Tableau is called VizQL. 
Essentially, it's allowing you to write SQL using a visualization uh, sort of technique. And so that's literally how Tableau works. When you drag and drop anything onto one of these uh, core areas, essentially anywhere here, you are telling Tableau how to build a chart. And it's interpreting that and building the chart for you, or you can tell it to change its behavior to do different things. One of those two. So you've just seen how I built a bar chart. It's very simple. Okay, let's clear the sheet again, going up here to the toolbar, click that. Let's try that again. I want to do a bar chart showing the sales for each subcategory. That's how the question might be framed at work. I'd go ahead and drag the subcategory onto rows. That puts it onto rows. You can see that each subcategory is taken up a row. That's how I remember it. And then sales is what I want to put on the bar chart. The total sales, I'll go put it on columns. And Tableau understands that to mean, hey, let's draw you a bar chart for this particular chart type. And notice this is just an alphabetical order. I've not changed this. Um, this is just how the data can, comes in. Actually, strictly speaking, it's data source order, which happens to be alphabetical order. But that's just how this data source works. Now, what if I want to change this? Well, normally bar charts are vertical. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense, right? You go from the bottom up, not from the left to the right, although sometimes you do have them like this. How do I change that? Well, it's exactly as you'd expect. If I wanted the sales on rows and the subcategories to be vertical, I'd just swap them around. So let's clear the sheet and do the exact opposite. Let's drag subcategory onto columns. You'll see it goes across and then sales onto rows. And now they're vertical, okay? So that's essentially the secret here. And there's actually a quicker way of doing what I just did if you get it the wrong way around. If you go up uh, here to the uh, very, very top, there's a, oh, no, that's not the, that's not the right annotation tool. Let's just go here. If you go there, there's a little sort of switcheroo icon, I call it. <laughs> and if you click it, it just swaps these two items around. Yeah. So these two items that I'm hovering over and you can see my mouse moving over. That's all it's swapping around. Okay. Excuse me. So now that you, you know that, the next thing you might want to do is to change the way this bar looks. Normally you go from largest to smallest or smallest to largest, right? Well, again, there's a bunch of icons to let you do that. Just here at the top, you can see that I've got this uh, descending and descending icon. If I click that, Tableau interprets that and changes the way the chart is sorted and pretty much does it for you, okay? The other place you'll see that icon is you'll see it also here. So you'll see Tableau is telling you, hey, I've done a sort here. It's going to show you that inside of what we call a pill in Tableau, okay? This Tableau hate this being called a pill, but we'll just call it a pill. <laughs> this looks like a pill. That's why it's called a pill. And um, it puts an icon there just to let you know that this particular subcategory item has been sorted. The logic is using sales values, okay? So it's sorted this by sales. The other place I can see this is if I just go over here, you'll see there's another sorting icon right there, okay? So if I go ahead and click on this icon over here on the left, you'll see that it also does the same thing, okay? It just switches them around, perfect. And if I go up here, you'll see that, oh, the icon's disappeared. Why is that? Well, when I was clicking through these sorts, you'll see it appears again, it appears again, and if I click it a third time, it goes back to the default sort order from the data source, which means no sorting. And now the icon disappears. If I go to the top, I can actually go here manually to the sort option, select it, and I can change based on an item in my visualization. So I select field, sales, sum, and now you'll see it's doing the same thing, descending or ascending. So this little interface is like the advanced way of sorting. And these two options here at the top are the quick way of sorting. In essence, these are just sort of the, the fast way of doing things. You just want to get things done quickly. And if you really want to dial in the way something's sorted, maybe you want to use something not in the visualization, you can actually go here, select that thing. And now I'm sorting things in ascending order of profit from left to right. Okay, so copies are actually the most profitable item, but I'm actually showing the total sales. Okay. So that's how you can sort of customize your sorting and kind of get, get where you need to with Tableau. I'll go ahead and uh, clear the sort again. Uh, I'll do it just by clicking this. I don't want to sort of confuse you by um, uh, <laughs> uh, 
going through and sort of clearing. So we'll, we'll worry about that later. Um, it's kind of, I just want to try and keep this as simple as possible. So that's how Tableau works. You drag and drop things onto the visualization. It changes the way the chart works. Now, so far, everything we've been doing, if you've noticed on the marks pane has had this terminology called automatic. Okay, what that means is the Tableau is automatically guessing which chart type you'd like to see. Okay, so let's sort of see what happens when we change things up. Okay, let's just move things a few around and see what Tableau automatically thinks things should be. If I move subcategory onto color, you'll see that it actually colors each, this one bar, because we've got nothing in columns, by each of the subcategories. Okay, makes a lot of sense. That's sort of cool to see, still a bar chart. Good to know. Now let's put this on label. You see, when you put it on label, Tableau doesn't know what to do because you've got nothing in columns and rows. So then it just says, okay, well, let's let's put it on text and let's color the text by the subcategory. You can see these are all different colors, okay? So Tableau again has now changed this to an automatic T. You can see it says T, that means text. You can see if I, you don't actually uh, get this when it says automatic, but if you, drop this drop down, you can actually see the different chart types that it's automatically defaulting to just right here. So text is what this one's on, okay? And if you understand this mechanic, you can pretty much build any chart in Tableau. By understanding the combination of what you use in columns and rows and the marks pane, you can get what you need. So let's start by taking on some sort of common chart types, okay? So well, we've done these two. We've done uh, how Tableau works and we've built our first chart. That was the bar chart. <laughs> let's uh, strike that through. And now let's kind of race through the chart types. We, we're gonna actually smash through this. And then I'll explain why I hate Shamu. <laughs> right, so a bar chart, you've seen this already. We'll drag the dimension, uh, the thing we'd like to break up our bars with. And we'll, in this case, I'll get subcategory. I'll put it on columns because I want this to be a vertical bar chart and I'll drag the measure, the numerical value that I'd like to use to control the size of the bars, drag that onto rows, and we're pretty much golden, okay? Now you can customize this, you can change a few things. Maybe you want that sales value on the bar chart so people can see what it is. Let's go ahead and drag sales, and this time you see there's an option here on the marks pane to put it on labels, and there you go, you get the value on the end of the labels, okay? Uh, maybe you'd like to change the formatting of this bar chart a little bit. Maybe you'd like this in dollars or pounds. You can just right click, select format. And on the left hand side, you get a formatting pane. that's pretty comprehensive. In there, I'll go to numbers and I'll select currency and I'll say a one, no decimal places. We'll do it in thousands. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll keep it as pounds. Uh, we'll do two decimal places. There you go. And now you can see the formatting has stuck through, but you're formatting the visualization. We didn't format the axis. To format the axis, you can just see there's another option right there. Select the axis, and now we can format that as well. Let's go to currency custom, and now that's all good. Now you're probably wondering, what well, surely Tableau should do this automatically, and absolutely you can. You see, what you can do, let's open up a new sheet by going down here, to pressing the plus sign on a new sheet. Just do that, and it opens a new sheet. What we can do is we can tell Tableau that look, this value here, this sales value has a number format that it should observe across the whole data source. So if we go to default properties and select number format, you'll see that currency can be set to standard and it will just use the currency for the country or you can set it to custom. We'll set it to English standard, select okay. And now if I build the same bar chart, put that on columns, put that on rows, you'll see that it's using the formatting of pounds. And even when I hover over the value inside of the tooltip is also pounds. Now this tooltip is nice. You can see that it turns up whenever I hover over anything. Okay. Now you can do a lot with tooltips. This is not the course for that, but if I select the tooltip option here in the marks pane, I can go in and customize that. I can change the way it works and you know, set it all up. Again, I've done a video on, it's about 40 minutes just on tooltips <laughs> that you can go and sort of watch and, and check out. It's gonna teach you everything you need to know, okay? So that is basically how to set up a bar chart. If you wanna change the rotation, you can just go ahead and do that. Now, you might want to sort of take it up a notch, you know, boss things up. You can have multiple things in your bar chart. For example, if I wanted to add a category as well as a subcategory, sub I can just go ahead and drag category 
in front of subcategory and it creates sections. And so this makes total sense. Essentially, this is a hierarchy. And in furniture, we have these specific uh, items. Now, what happens if I get those two the wrong way around? Well, you'll just see it. If the data doesn't support the structure you think that's going to work, you'll just see it in the visualization. It just looks wrong. Okay. So if there's a hierarchy, things tend to work much better that way, and you can set things up like this. Okay. The very final thing I'll show you is I said I'd show you where the reference lines were. Anytime you see an axis, for example, this one on the left with numerical values, if you right click on it, you'll see the option to add a reference line. And in Tableau, you get four options. Now, most people understand reference lines, but you can also create reference bands, distributions, and you can even mess around with box plots. Essentially, this is where you create box and risk of plots in Tableau. But you can see if I create a line here, it's just going to give me the average for each section. And I can actually change the level that this works at. Um, again, lots of people have done videos on reference lines, but in essence, I can set it to draw a line across the entire table, draw a line just in each section, or draw a line on each line. But it doesn't make sense to do the average of each line because it will just be the line. <laughs> so for average, it doesn't make sense. This makes more sense. Where per cell might make more sense is if you're using targets. Let's so say you've got targets for each of these subcategories. You could use this option, okay? So play around with these options. This is not the video to sort of touch on that. Just going to let you know that there's a lot you can do here. Play around with all these options. They are as straightforward as they look, and they're really, really powerful, okay? So there's our bar chart. We've set it up. It looks beautiful. One last thing, one, one very final thing you might do to customize this is to break these bars down based on something else. Let's say you want to show within each of these bars the uh, shipping mode that was used. So I'll go ahead and grab shipping mode and I'll drag it onto color. And so what Tableau will do is it will use the color to break down my bar and that color denotes the shipping mode, okay? And you can see, I can hover over it. All of that information is in the tooltip. Again, if you want to customize the tooltip, select the tooltips option and just open it. Okay. Now, I see people trying to build you know, charts like this using Show Me, and it's just really hard to do. You'll get lost, you'll get confused, and you'll end up with way too many things in the view. You don't need to do it. I've just shown you how. You're just using columns and rows and the marks pane to control how everything works. The ship mode is controlling the color. The category and the subcategory are controlling the top level headers and the bottom, basically the columns you see. And the sales values are going across controlling the rows, which gives us the size of the bars. That's it. Okay, let's uh, go ahead and rename this. Uh, let's call this bar chart. Perfect. Next chart, pie chart. Wow, the most dreaded chart in analytics. <laughs> this is dead easy, okay? So for this one, I always recommend people, listen, stop using automatic immediately for this chart type. You could get away with doing it, but just switch this drop down here to pie. Once you've got pie, it's just straightforward, okay? The size of the pie is going to be controlled by sales. Yeah, that would give me the percentages. And then the color of each section is going to be controlled by the category. And there you go. You have three equal sections. But we don't have three equal proportions. It can't be 33%. Look at the values. These aren't exactly the same. They're slightly different. So what we need to do is also drag sales onto angle. And now you can see that this actually now is starting to look a little bit better, okay? So the size actually denotes the size of the whole circle, whereas this sales value on angle denotes the angle. Let's clear the sheet and let's try again with something with a little bit sort of more obvious sections. Let's try a, dare I say it, ship mode, okay? So let's go back to pie chart. And uh, we'll put ship mode on color. You can see we have four ship modes. I put sales on angle. Now you can see that working nicely. And I could put sales on size, but it's not really going to do something because the, the size sort of controls the whole size of the circle. But nonetheless, there you go. That's it. That's a pie chart. Super simple. You might want the percentages on the end of it. So how do you do that? Well, you can do two things. You can drag sales onto label, but it's going to give you the whole number. That's not very nice. Okay. So what you can do is you select the one that says T, the label. And you want to go down here to quick table calculation and select percentage of total. That gives you the percentage. And now that you've done that, you can right click on the uh, visualization itself and select format and go to fields and select percentage of total sum of sales. 
and here you can change the percentage okay so you can say percentage uh just uh, no decimal places and that's it that's that's your pie chart done okay nice and easy donut chart <laughs> oh god donut charts <sighs> donut charts are popular so i'll show you how to do them let's go ahead and create a calculated field to do this i just need to bring this on screen and you don't need to pay attention to what's going on here you just want to do this create create a value uh, you could actually even just do this the number one that's what you need to do We'll just call this calculation one. Hit apply, hit okay. Now that we've done that, we can go ahead and do this. You can see when we put the number one, it splits it out. But what I want to do is actually find the average of one, which is one. Then holding option or command or control, I can't remember which it is on window, I can create a duplicate, okay? Oh, is it letting me do that? No, nope, it's not gonna let me do that. Uh, why is it not letting me do that? There we go, I was holding the wrong key. It's actually command for me on the Windows machine. And now that I've done that, you see we have two. And on the left, we also have two. So on the second one, I'm going to go ahead and remove everything. I'm just going to go ahead, remove the color, remove the size, just going to remove everything. Okay, we just remain with a circle. I'll make the circle uh, larger, actually smaller, and we'll change the color to white. Okay, now you can't see it yet. It's just right there. And the final trick is to go down to the second one and select dual axis, okay? And then you'll see, oh, it's nearly a donut. And all you need to do is right click on this one and synchronize the axis and there's your donut chart. The final thing to do is to set the axis to start and finish basically at the same point. So you can set it to start at one and finish at one. And then it sits in the middle. And then once you've done that, you can uh, go ahead Hide your header, you've got a donut chart. I don't know why it's that complex in Tableau. Don't 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 have a go at me. It's just the way it is. Okay. So there we go. That's a donut chart in Tableau. So in this particular tab, I use the trick of creating one and essentially I use a dual axis to create two calculations that sit on top of each other that are basically the same. And that is known as a hack. I hate hacks. Uh, I didn't want to show you a hack, but someone asked for a donut chart, so I had to, I had to show you the hack because it is required for Tableau, at least for now. Um, I hate hacks, so go check out this video, Hacks in Tableau, to so find out why. But this trick, this this trick of creating the calculation one and using it to create instances that you can then you know use and use again and again, actually happens quite a lot. Um, let let me show you like a real a real use case for it. Okay, so let's let's say that I didn't use a dual axis here. Let's just split these two up, and let's say that this color is actually going to be red, just just for argument's sake. Okay, now what I could do is I could put these two side by side like that and have them on the left. And I could essentially keep going. I could create more copies like this. And all it's allowing me to do is to take the same copy of the same thing multiple times. But now each of those pie charts could show different things in one chart. So for example, this one is colored by ship mode but I could color this one by subcategory and you'll see that it changes that one. I could go to this one. I could color this by product. This is gonna be nasty. <laughs> never do that, please never do that. I didn't teach you how to do this, well I just did, but I never tell anyone that I taught you how to do this. Um, it's just not beautiful at all. So this is why you use that hack to basically get the same instance of something and then you can do something different with each instance. Now. I'm not going to show you another hack that allows you to do the same thing in a clean way. But recently, uh, a new feature with maps was introduced that allows you to do exactly that. You could create multiple instances of something and using mapping placing, you could essentially get them on different parts of your chart. But again, I didn't teach you this. Uh, I don't teach people hacks, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> so let me, let me delete these because uh, we don't need all these extra ones. We'll go ahead and do dual axis on that again. And we'll uh, ooh, we'll end up needing to show the axis. Where is the axis? We'll show the header. There we go. We'll synchronize the axis. Uh, we'll edit the axis. We'll set the fix so it's one. The reason I'm doing this on one and one is so that both of the axis are perfectly aligned or centered. By only having one value on the axis, it basically becomes centered. Go ahead, deselect the header, and there you have. You can go ahead and format these uh, lines to not show as well. But essentially, they're on top of each other. And with the second one, I'll just go ahead and remove the color, set it to smaller size. Oh, 
Uh, oh, why is it why is it changing both of them? Oh, 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 oh. Let's see what's going on here. Oh, I think I um. What is it doing here? What did I do wrong? So we've got this one here. Okay, I just need to remove everything on this one. Then make that smaller, and then that works. Yeah, I lost my lost my trail of thought. And then we can make this uh, white. And there you go. It's a donut shop. Okay. Um, line charts are super simple. Um, first of all, go get the measure or the numeric value you want to use. So in this case, you could use rows. Um, and we just have the total sales in this particular case. And then you want to create a line chart using something that would naturally create a line in a visualization. So for this, I'll go get the order date, drop it in, and we'll set this to day. And you'll see it gets very noisy. Day is too much. Let's go to month. There you go. That's a bit of a nicer line chart. And you can change this again, go to week. That's pretty nice. Now, I'm clicking this little toggle on the right, and I'm just ignoring all of these options, and I'm going straight down here to these dates. I'm doing that because in the next step, I'll just I'll explain why. But for now, um, to create a line chart, it's not going to work if you select something. Well, it does work. But what it's doing doesn't make obvious sense until I explain the next step, which is discrete versus continuous items. Okay. So for now, I'm just going to keep it at month. That makes way more sense. It starts at the beginning of the data set, ends at the end of the data set, and everything's in the scale. Okay. Line chart, super simple. You measure the thing you're going to use to draw the line, whether it's dates, numerical values. It's typically going to be two green things, typically. If it's not, then you've probably tweaked the chart a little bit, and we'll see some examples of that as well. Okay. The next one is discrete versus continuous. And I've, I've termed this discrete versus continuous dates, but strictly speaking, this is just discrete versus continuous. So um, you'll notice that here you have uh, a bunch of blue and a bunch of green items. Okay, Earlier on, I talked about this, and I said it wasn't to do with anything to do with uh, measures and dimensions. It's instead to do with this concept of discrete versus continuous values. And the dates are actually a pretty good way of showing you showing you that. So let's let's go ahead and do this. Let's drag cells onto rows, and let's drag the order date onto columns. Now, Tableau has a pretty good understanding of dates. So whenever I drag any date field, it defaults to the year of that date. Unlike other tools where you have to go out and build a like a, a date model, you don't have to do that with Tableau. It understands dates pretty well. And if I select this drop down, you'll see that I get two selections. I can use the year here at the top, and I can use the year and a bunch of other values again here at the bottom. And so if I select, let's say, this version of the year, you see you still get a line chart, but this item here at the top is blue. However, if I go down and select this year, which also says 2015, it changes to green, and now we get a scale. And so the difference between these blue and green items is actually to do with the fact that Discrete and continuous items behave differently in Tableau. Discrete items tend to group data together. So if I, let's say, choose 20, uh, choose the year and choose 2015, you'll see it grabs everything in 2019 and puts it into the bucket called 2019. But if I choose a continuous year, it tends to want to draw a continuous scale. So you can see here at the bottom, there is no bucket anymore. It's got a scale. 2019 to 2022. And so that allows me to essentially change the, the resolution of this scale, but it always shows the full range of the scale every single time because this is a continuous item. So continuous items will tend to want to give you a scale, an axis, and discrete items will tend to want to give you sort of a grouping, uh, like a box that fits everything that's inside of that box. So just to pay attention to that, switch to this version of the year. You can see it says 2019, 2020, 21. These are all buckets. There's no scale. There's no time in that. Switch to this one. You get the full scale uh, as you go through. Now, because I've switched to the full scale, it draws a line in between the different years. It doesn't sort of uh, extrapolate the lines. It just assumes that this is the only data point in the year, and it draws a line to the next year. If I then go down here and select quarter, that the, the axis stays the same length, but now the axis gets more granular, and now you get more information. This is still continuous. If I then go to quarter up here, something different happens. 
you see, if we select quarter, it goes it, it goes discrete as I, as I described before. But this time, it's grouping up everything in every year in one quarter. So this is not just Q1 for the first year. It's Q1 for every year. This is Q2 for every year. I can show you that by dragging order date in again, and you can see this is the years at the top. Okay. And now you've got two discrete dates and a continuous item. The continuous item is generating the scale on the left hand side. But the two discrete items here at the top are breaking up my bar, my line chart into different components. Okay. And it's still a line chart, still broadly creating what we need. But each of these dots is sitting inside of a bucket. The bucket is the quarter. If I change that second one to a continuous one, you'll see it gives me a full scale in between each quarters, okay? So that's like a, a very brief but important guide into the difference between the blue and the green fields. That's why they're that, those colors. They make charts behave differently. Anything green will want to draw an axis. Anything blue will want to group everything into one particular dimension, whether it's the year, whatever, that the the child of that dimension will be the grouping essentially whereas anything green will give you a continuous scale as, as much as the scale allows okay so knowing that you can sort of manipulate dates as we've just done we've drawn a couple of different line charts here but you can change the way these work just to kind of get different combinations working so maybe you want each these uh, lines broken down by year but you'd like the continuous months inside of them so you can visualize these lines that's going to work really nicely what you could also do is you could take that visual separation, instead of having them here on the chart, you can drag the year and put it on color. And now you still get the continuous scale because those months fall in specific places on the scale, but it's now colored in different colors. So it's easy to see. However, if I go here to the month and I make these uh, discrete, you'll see that it groups all the months together. So all the Januaries go into that bucket all the February's in that bucket, but because I've put the year on color, it's splitting out the lines by color, okay? So again, the behavior changes, uh, the, the, the sorry, the pills on the different parts of the chart changes the behavior, and that behavior gives you the different chart types. And with that logic, you don't need to use Show Me. You can pretty much get through most of what you need to know in Tableau just by learning how this interaction works, okay? So let's have a look at this. Uh, let's see what we've done so far. So, Let's uh, keep going. The analytics pane in Tableau. So far, we've done bar charts, we've done donuts, we've done line charts, we've done uh, different types of line charts with discrete and continuous. Let's uh, build something different. Let's build another bar chart. Let's go ahead and build this by region. Let's go ahead and do that. Yes, that's great. And we'll build, oh, let's say profit. That's pretty nice. Um, but let's say I want to break that down by shipping mode. And put that over there. Okay, we've just sort of changed the dynamic a bit. It looks a bit different. It's nice to see. If I go to the analytics pane, just up here, you can see where my mouse is shaking. Um, you get different options that you can sort of bring into the visualization. So if I wanted to create that reference line we saw before for average, I could have just dragged that in. And it gives me the same options I saw in that reference line pane, just right here. So I can go ahead, drop it on the pane, and now I get the average for each pane. Dead simple. I can bring another one drop it in the table, and I get another one for the table. That's how it works. So all of these are sort of aggregations, and you can go ahead and oops, you can go ahead and simply use them to change the way the chart works. So that, that's it. That's all you need to know about the analytics pane for now. <laughs> As you drag them in, it tells you where to put them, and you can use that to sort of customize them. If you want to edit them, you can click on them and select Edit, and then you just get the same options I showed you earlier. Okay. In the, uh, that's the analytics pane, it's super simple and short. Um, let's do a few more, scatter plots. So for a scatter plot, you typically need two axes. So let's say we're gonna have sales and we're gonna have profit and we get one dot. It's not very interesting. What makes a scatter plot a scatter plot is we can see different dimensions and where they sit on this scale. So if we went and got segment and put it on detail, we can see that we get three dots because there's three segments. If I put that segment on color, we get the same behavior, but now each one is colored differently. Kind of handy. 
now that I've got those segments colored, I can go and go ahead and get something else. I can maybe go and get the products and put that on detail. And it will take a while, but now each product is colored. It's a dot and it's colored using the segment, okay? And you can change that interaction around a bit. I, there's no point putting color on product name because that's not going to be a sort of an attractive visualization. But you can mess around with these sort of combinations to create different variants. And don't forget, you can still rotate your chart how you want. Okay, you can just go ahead and do that and you're pretty much creating different customizations. The shape of these circles can be customized too. So let's say you want maybe uh, filled circles instead. You can just go ahead and select that. Uh, you could do stars. Or here's a, here's a really cool trick. You can drag the subcategory and put that on shape. And it will complain, but it will make a different shape for each subcategory. Okay. Kind of a nice chart to, to look at, very basic, um, but you can start to get an idea of what you can do with this, okay? So just customize it as much as you want, change it up, um, go into the tooltips and add more detail. The last thing I'll show you with this is you can still use dimensions up here in columns and rows. So let's say I want to go and get the category and put it in front of sales. You'll see I'll get three scatter plots. And then let's say I want to get the ship mode and put it here in rows. I'll get a grid of four by three, each with a scatter plot inside of it, okay? So again, as you're learning Tableau, try and mess around with different combinations, see what they do and understand why they do those things, okay? Super simple. Right, that's the scatter plot. So histograms, now, a histogram and a bar chart are kind of similar. It, you know, visually they're the same, but they actually represent different things. Um, the best way I've thought of describing a histogram is it's like a bar chart, but it takes something that typically doesn't, you know, sit in groups and creates a grouping out of it. So the most common example you might think of a histogram is uh, maybe you're creating ranges from, let's say, zero to ten, ten to fifteen, fifteen to twenty. Uh, when you group those up. They become discrete, they become blue essentially. And then you can use that separation to create a grouping and that grouping can then be visualized. And that's essentially what a histogram allows us to do. Now, one of the techniques that you might use to do that is you might uh, create something called a bin. And a bin is like a bucket. It's like a bucket of a grouping. Essentially you're putting things into a group and you are then gonna use that group to visualize something. So to give you an example, I'm going to take the sales values here. I'm going to right click on that and I'm going to go to create and I'm going to select bins. And this is essentially going to create those groupings I was talking about. And then I get this interface, which basically asks me how big I'd like those bins to be. And Tableau looks at the data and comes up with a pretty good um, you know, estimate. And the thing to bear in mind is this, this is happening at the row level of detail. So it's looking every row, row of data looking at the sales and it's coming up with this size based on the general spread of the data and how it all looks. You can set a minimum and a max and play around with all of these things, but the suggested bin side is what that is there. You can enter your own value. So if you wanted that to be 500, you could, but let's go ahead and just select 510. And now that we've created that bin, you'll see that we get this new icon just over here on the left-hand side with like a pyramid and these bars. And this now is something that we can use as a bin, okay? So now that I've created the sales bins, I've essentially taken something that was previously a continuous item. Uh, you know, if I bring the sales onto rows, um, it creates an axis. That's how I know that it's a continuous value. And uh, you can see that this measure is green as well. But now when we make a bin from sales, it creates a discrete item here. And now you can see the separation is uh, roughly 510 uh, pounds in this case across each of these groupings. What that allows me to do is I can then visualize it. So I've rotated it 90 degrees just so it goes across because that makes the most sense for a bar chart. We want the bars to be vertical. Then I will drag the actual cells and put it on rows. So you might be thinking, what is this chart showing me? Well, I've taken each and every cell on every row and I've grouped them into bins. And then I've actually asked Tableau to aggregate all the cells that belong in those bins. And so what this chart is showing me is that the majority of the cells in this data set are between zero to 510 pounds. And that equates to 847,000 over the entirety of this data set. 
And as you get to bigger and bigger transactions, the uh, sales become less and less. So we do have some uh, rather large sales um, all the way out here on the right hand side. But you kind of get the curve you'd expect. You kind of get this sort of nice sort of tapered curve. And this is sort of normal. You'd expect this kind of distribution generally with data. And um, there tends to be quite a, you know, a body of um, information or data at one particular point, just just, 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 just the way the analytics works and statistics work. Um, you can watch lots of videos on YouTube that explain that better than I can. Um, so yeah, there, there we have it. It's a very simple histogram. It's, there's not, there's not much more to it. But this, although it looks like a bar chart, this is technically a histogram. Now, one of the things you could do is you could customize this a little bit. So um, you can see here that the sales bin, the top is uh, blue. Now, if I go here and change it to continuous you'll see that the grouping along here changes. Essentially what happens is that blue bin um, stops becoming a grouping and it becomes a range. And the bars still sit within that range. You can see this here at the bottom. And it just basically goes from left to right and uh, it works exactly as you expect. So just because something is blue or discrete doesn't mean you can't change it just by changing these two options. So this is almost a continuation from the previous point I made about discrete versus continuous, okay? So that is a handy trick to be aware of because what we've done in this chart is we've taken two values, well, one value, and we've made two things out of it. One is a bin, one is the actual sales value. We've made the bin continuous and then we've visualized them against each other to create a grouping of the thing itself. Okay. So that is a histogram in a nutshell. Um, it's a very simple chart. What I often find is that, look, bar charts are just much easier to build and just much easier for people to understand. With a histogram, you, you tend to find you have to just explain it a little bit more because these groupings aren't as apparent because you can't fit everything nicely in the axis. Where you tend to find histograms work really well is in surveys where you have a scale, uh, maybe you're asking people about their age and you have a zero to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20. That makes really good um, sort of histogram-like uh, data sets uh, really that you can use to do that, okay? Right, let's go on to the bullet graph. Now the bullet graph is a is, is a bar chart. Let's <laughs> let me just simplify that straight away. So let's go ahead and take the subcategory, and we'll take the we won't take the category. We won't confuse things. We'll just take the subcategory, and we'll take the cells. Okay, and uh, I'll rotate this ninety degrees by going to this icon just up here, and we'll rotate it like that. This is going to make it easier for you guys to see what's going on. Now one of the things we've done in the past is we've gone into the analytics pane and we've brought an average or some sort of reference line, okay? But in some cases, you might actually want to use another value uh, to use on the chart. Rather than bringing in a reference line, you might actually want another bar to sit on top of the existing bar chart that you've got. So a good example might be, let's say you want to do some modeling, okay? And to do this, I'm actually gonna create a calculation, which is jumping a bit ahead, but you'll, it's easy to follow along, so you'll be able to do it. And what I'll do is I'll go ahead and create a calculation. So what I did there is I went to this little uh, triangle icon and I selected create calculated field. And I just brought this uh, calculation window up. Now these calculations work like you'd expect in Excel. Um, you can do aggregate calculations and row level calculations. I'll explain those two shortly, but for now, just follow along with exactly what I'm doing, okay? So I'm just gonna go ahead and aggregate all my cells by saying sum of cells. And what I want to do is multiply that by uh, 20%. So I'll just put 0 0.2. I'm not gonna bother right, doing the percentage. I'll just say, just increase everything by 20%, okay? And we'll call this sales uh, plus uh, 20%, okay? Now, technically speaking, what I should do is do 1.2 because that's basically adding 20% to the whole percentage. So that's actually what I should do. Uh, hit apply and hit okay, okay? So now that we've done that, um, I have two sales values. I've got uh, sales and I've got sales plus 20%. And I'll grab the sales plus 20% and I'll put it right next to the other one. So you can see it creates two charts for us. What I'd like to do is have these two on top of each other, essentially taking up the same space so you can see the differences between the two values. So now that I've got them two side by side, I can go to the second one, go down to what's called dual axis, and it will change the chart type. Now this drives people absolutely crazy because you had a bar chart and then it's changed it to circle plots. Well, what's going on? Well, 
it turns out that because we have automatic here in the marks pane, Tableau is making a constant decision about the chart types we'd like to see. So if I go back and this time, instead of having it on automatic, I keep it at bar. When I go to do the dual axis, you'll see Tableau doesn't change it from a bar chart. And so this has worked. Now, the second thing is you can see that here on the legend, you can see there's two different values, sales and sales plus 20% but I can't see the sales values. And that's because the orange ones have 20% more sales. And if they're on top of each other, the blue sales are actually right behind these orange ones. So to bake this a bullet graph, all you need to do is go to the, uh, set, uh, the, the orange sales value, which is sitting on top, and just change the size of the bar. And as we change the size of the bar, you can see that those two values are actually right on top of each other. So we're making one thinner than the other. This reveals a new problem which is that the values are the same, although I did tell Tableau to add 20% to the cell. So what's going on? Well, the biggest clue is in the axis. So if I look at the axis here, 300,000 is there, but for 300,000 over here, it's, it's just down there. It's not correct. So what we do is we go to the second axis and select synchronize axis, and that will get this working nicely. So now the bullet graph is working, and you can see all the cells are now 20%. Now, realistically, this isn't what you do. You wouldn't just add 20% to all the sales. What you might do is you might have some targets, you might have some goals, and you might have those as another figure. Let's say you have sales and then you have budgeted sales. This is how you'd use a bullet craft to show how one is comparing to the other. And you can play around with which one you'd like to be the more prominent one or which one you'd like to be the better one. But once you have things set up, you can kind of make things a lot better. Now, if you do use a chart like this, it's often handy to just make it really clear which axis refers to which. So um, the legend is often a good example. And because both of these values are monetary, I could just go ahead and hide one of the axes so then I don't have to worry about it. And I can just say, look, this is the legend that tells you what is what. But in, an, in some cases, you might actually want to keep the axis. So one of the things you can do is you can right click, format the axis, and just change something like the color. You could you could change the, the color of the Pacific um, uh, axis itself, or you can go and change the color of the text just to make it more apparent what's going on. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of options here. You can kind of <laughs> knock yourself out. There's a whole range of things. So, um, you know, have a go at doing that. I won't go into too much detail because I could spend easily 40 minutes just on formatting in Tableau. Um, but it's all there, you know how to do it. Just right click on the item, select format, and then you can play around with the selections as you want. So that in a nutshell is essentially a histogram. Uh, sorry, that is essentially a bullet graph. So we're basically building one on top of the other. Now, the other thing that people do sometimes do is they then add some sort of reference line. So you can still do that. You can just go ahead and get some sort of reference line. Maybe you want to visualize the profit. So what we can do is we can go and get the uh, profit uh, and put it on detail. The reason I'm putting it on detail is because I want to use it. And we've got it on sales plus 20%. We'll go to the analytics pane, and then we'll go and get, um, what, what, what will we use? We'll use a reference line, and we can drop it on one of these pills. You notice that now because we have two values, it's telling me where I'd like to put it. So I'd like to put it on each individual item. So we'll go to the cell, and I want to put it on sales plus 20%. So that's sort of the combination of the two things. And I'll drop it there. And then it'll say, okay, what value would you like to use in the reference line? And because we put our profit right there on the detail for sales plus 20%, it's available to us in this drop down. So we can go ahead, select it, and you can choose whatever value you want. Average, maximum, and minimum are all going to do the same thing because there's only sort of one value in this particular. Um, actually, no, that's incorrect. The profit is going to be aggregated. So if I choose average profit, it's going to show me the average profit. What I really want is the total profit because that makes sense in this chart, which actually adds everything up. So go ahead and do that. And you can see the OK button kind of um, weirded out a little bit. We can go ahead and maybe set this dotted. And uh, let's just go ahead and say profit, sum of profit. And you can see, uh, let me make this red, actually. So it's super, super obvious. And it'll make it really thick and dotted, not transparent. Actually, we'll make it solid. And you can see in the background, it's kind of changing that a little bit. So now the reference line is uh, reflecting the changes I'm making, okay? So that's how you can keep adding a little bit more context. What I'd really encourage you to do is spend a bit of time on color and a little bit on color theory just to make things really, really obvious. So maybe you might uh, double click on sales and make sales gray because it's, it's a less prominent item. 
you might make sales plus 20% uh, purple just to make it a little bit easier in the eye. And there you go. That's immediately much easier to see. And then this, this um, reference line we've added, we can actually just click on it, select edit and make that a, a, a nicer shade of something else. Maybe uh, let's go for a paler red. And there you go. Immediately a little bit more accessible, much easier. And um, if you have any people with accessibility needs, then just bear the, their color needs in mind as well. Okay. Okay. Box and whisper. Whisker. Whis whisper or whisker? It should be whisker. Gosh. <laughs> Bots and whisker plots. Now for this one, um, this is a it's an interesting chart because it's typically one that you'd use to show the the spread of data. And normally, when someone's asking for this, they specifically want this. So um, let me just show you how it works. For this one, I'll drag subcategory onto uh, columns actually because we want the vertical uh, separation between each of the uh, subcategories. And then what I'm going to do next is going to be a little bit odd. I'll put I'll put sales on rows, okay, and you'll see it builds a bar chart. And because we're still on automatic, Tableau will keep changing the chart based on what I add to the visualization. So if I put product name on detail, what Tableau understands is that I'd like to see each product uh, broke this bar chart broken down by products. Now, in real terms, that's actually not what I want to see. What I'd like to see is a dot that represents each product. So let's go ahead to automatic and change that to a circle. And you'll see a dot appear for where each product sits on that whole scale. So this is a lot easier. It also means we're not getting the aggregate effect of all these products sitting on top of each other. In essence, each dot is kind of its own uh, individual thing on this visualization, and it's a lot easier to sort of see. Now, these dots are a little bit hard to sort of make out. So what I could do is I could add the profits to the side so I can see which are the profitable dots and which ones aren't. And you'll see that we actually have some negative values, which can't really be smaller than, you can't have like a negative size in Tableau. So that's not going to work. So maybe that's a bad decision. Instead, maybe you want to put profit on the color so we can see whether they're profitable or not using a color range. So instead of using profit, I'm going to show you something new. We'll click on the circle and we're going to select the color. This allows us to change what this is doing without having to move it around. And now you can see a much, much better color. Okay. So because of this, it's much easier now to see which ones are profitable, which ones aren't. And uh, we can actually change the size a little bit. You can do a few things to sort of format this better. Uh, you can go and change the border just to give it some more contrast, maybe make these dark. Whatever you want to do, um, the world's your oyster. Change it as much as you want. But we're trying to build a box and whisker plot, not a, not a sort of a pseudo you know, scatter plot. <laughs> now, to do that, once we've got this set up, once we've got the sort of spread and the detail covered, we go to the analytics pane and you can see there's an option here for box plots. Okay, this is essentially what a box and whisker is. And as soon as I start dragging it onto cell, you'll see that there's only one option and that is essentially to create a box and whisker for each subcategory that I've got in the visualization. As Soon as I drop it on, Tableau thinks about it. Uh, is it gonna do something about it? No, no. Oh, I did do something. I didn't even see it. I was so fixed on this top dot top data point. I didn't see the box and whiskers down here. So that was instantaneous. Um, apologies on my part. I should pay more attention to the lower end of the data. Uh, but yeah, there you go. You can see that the box and whisker plot has turned up. It's a little bit hard to see. So how do you actually fix this? To me, this, this is not ideal because it's not what you have in mind when you do a box and whisker plot. And the problem is, is that if you learn it to do, if you learn how to do it this way, you don't actually know where the settings are. So let's go back a step, just going to the back button up here, and we've removed the box plot. You see, block spot is just a reference line. It's a type of reference line. See, if you go to add reference line, you get this interface again, and you can go all the way across to box plot, and you can see you get the full settings here. And you can change how the box plot works. So let me move it across. You can see that it's just right there. I can tell it to hide the underlying marks, that takes away all the dots that sit underneath the uh, box plot, but it doesn't take the ones that are outside of the extremes. But I can also change the way that works. So if I say maximum extent of the data, then you see the box plot takes up every single data point. So it's depending on what you're going for, you might want this or you might want this. Uh, and I think box plots are defined by um, one of these two settings, either the whole extent of the data or 1.5 times the interquartile range, whatever that is, okay? So choose whichever one you want. You can choose a style. There's glass, 
classic, uh, classic with dual fill. All of this stuff is pretty good. Okay. And then you can change the color, you can change the, the extent. You can pretty much customize it how you want, change how the whiskers look, if, even if you want to do that. And there you go. You have your box block. It's super simple. Um, now, the good thing about this is this doesn't stop you adding other bits of information on top of this. So if you wanted to, you could add another set of uh, items, maybe another reference line, whatever you wanted to do, those are still available to you. So if I bring a sales item in again, you see it draws two box plots. And for this one, I can go ahead and change how this works or change how it behaves, okay? So just because you've built one thing doesn't mean you can't customize it. You can always pretty much dynamically change what you're seeing here in Tableau very, very easily, okay? So there we go, that's our box plot. Uh, box uh, plot. Cool. Right, a tree map. I like the tree maps. Tree maps are very good. I like them. Um, the simplest way to show you this is just to basically uh, draw a simple one with just three items in it. So I'll drag category onto color. That gives us three dots, three squares. Now that I've got that, I'd like each square to be sized by the size of the cells that they have. So if I just go ahead and put sales on size, you'll see that we get a tree map. That's literally as simple as it is. Okay, now what we can do with the cells is we can put cells on the label and the label will give us the values, okay? And we can use this to maybe add some context, maybe make it a little bit nicer. And the other thing we can do is we can add the name of the category onto the label again. That will add that to the tooltip and um, actually adds it to the label. So if you want to customize it, you can just click on the label, go to these three dots and you can change the way uh, these sort of sit. So <laughs> it's funny, it says category cells, but if I hit apply, it actually appears like that. So it, it was kind of doing some hierarchy stuff, but it wasn't kind of showing what it wanted to. Now you might find it distracting that this label here is black and these two are white. And um, what Tableau has is this uh, engine in the background, which looks at the color and it tries to denote whether the contrast is accessibility friendly or not. And if it's not, it changes the color to something that is better. Okay, so in this case, it's saying that white is better on these two colors and black is better on these two colors. If you want to kind of lock that in, you can uh, go to the label actually and just change the color yourself. So if I go to text, and I go to this uh, formatting, you can say, just lock it into white, hit apply. Uh, why is that not working? Uh, have I done the right thing? Uh, I might not have done the right thing. Okay, apologies. Um, you have to do this on the font settings. <sighs> Tableau is so inconsistent sometimes because you do have a formatting option there on the label, but this formatting option only works on um, some chart types because you can see here, it doesn't apply it to this. Instead, I have to go to the font select white, and now it does apply, okay? There's a couple of other ones, options here, which is automatic, which is what I've just explained. A match mark color makes it roughly the same, but still makes it easy, easy to see. Sometimes that's a nice option just to keep things in theme. Now, a nice thing with this tree map is you can actually add layers to it. That's kind of confusing because you're thinking, well, how can I add more layers to this? Well, if I bring a subcategory into the detail, you can see that the coloring is still following the category, but now it's broken these individual slots down into the subcategories. And so I might want to put subcategory on the label as well, just so it's clear that those sections exist. And then what I might do is I might then go and add another uh, breakdown. Let's go maybe with the shipping mode, okay? And if we do that again, you'll see that it creates even bigger uh, spacing between the groups and it kind of breaks it down. So you can visually separate the different sections and you can add as many sort of breakdowns as you want into the visualization, as long as you understand the hierarchy of the data to break this down and kind of do different um, chart types that are much more interesting, okay? So that is the tree map in a nutshell. You can change this around, obviously the tooltip, everything. It's completely interactive if you want it to be as well. We'll show you how to do that later on. So let's go ahead and call this tree map, okay? Now the... Um, Next one, let's go box and whisker and just uh, cross that out. Strike and strike out the tree map and make sure that's out. Good. So colored tables. <laughs> this is a this is an absolute brain tease sometimes in Tableau because it's it's simple but it's not simple. So let let me just show you what I'm trying to do. Let's say we want to do a table that shows the cells going across each quarter over the last few years. 
columns. Okay, so to do that, I'll drag order date onto columns. You can see that it brings out the years. Now, because Tableau has an understanding of dates, it actually breaks down the dates for me into years, quarters, and dates. I don't need to do the calculation to do that. I don't need like a date model to come into my data set. I can just bring it in and select the part that I want. So in this case, I selected quarter. If I didn't want quarter, I could just go down to month and then remove uh, whatever I wanted. Um, but in this case, I do want quarter. So I'll just go year and quarter. I'd actually want both of those, not just quarter on its own. Okay. The next thing I'll do is I'll bring subcategory onto rows just to give us a nice table. And the reason it says ABC is because we haven't got any information on the label. So as soon as we add sales onto label, then it fills it, okay? So this is a nasty table. We don't like this. It's really hard to see. I can't really tell what's performing well and what's not, okay? Now, if I want this to fill the width of the screen, I can actually go up here to standard and say fit width, and Tableau will kind of squash it to fit the width of my screen. And now that I've got it like this, what I'd like to do is add some colors to this to help me see where things are going well and things are going badly. So let me go ahead and drag the profit onto color and see what happens, okay? Now, when we do that, a couple of things happen. Firstly, everything goes to a hashtag. The reason that is, is because we brought the legend in and that squashed the view to a size that no longer allows me to fit all the text. So if I bring that legend over to this side, then you can see that the spacing works again, but that's not really a long-term solution. I think because my screen is kind of squashed because I've got the agenda and everything, it's just a spacing kind of conflict. You could make the, the, the text smaller as well if you wanted to do that to kind of get around that. Right-click format and then change change the formatting uh, formatting controls over there, okay? But this isn't what we want. What we'd want is the text in one color and then in the background a different color. And so what's, what's going on here is that Tableau is actually doing what I asked it to do. You see, I dragged the profit onto color. And because it's saying automatic, what Tableau has decided is that the type of chart you want is a text chart, and it's automatically going to then mean that the color is going to color the text. What we actually want is we want a square with the label as text, not a table with text, and then the color in the background being something else, right? So if I choose this to a square, now the color sits on the square, and the sales value sits on the label and the label goes on top of the square and now we have a colored heat map. So then what I can do is I can uh, squash this again and now we can see where there's issues, okay? And Tableau chooses this um, sort of blue and red or orange color scheme because again, it's um, accessibility friendly compared to red and, red and, red and uh, green. And it, this makes it much, much easier to see in this data set the, the badly performing uh, categories, but also the quarters in which things didn't go so well. And it's obviously contextual to the whole visualization. The scale is looking at the whole visualization. So depending on what you choose, this scale will naturally change. If you want to change that, you can go to edit colors and you've got a bit more control here. You can say stepped colors, which just you know locks down a limited set of colors. That can sometimes make it easier to kind of make sense of what's actually doing badly. Um, you can add more steps. Uh, you could change uh, the different sort of sizes as well. It just depends. If you go to advanced, you can actually lock in a start and an end and even where the center is. So you could say the center is kind of off center just to make the coloring kind of work exactly how you want. Um, and then you've also got the uh, wide list of options that you can choose here as well. So uh, I won't do much of that formatting. I'll just go back to the, the, the default uh, settings uh, and we'll just hit apply. Uh, we won't do nine steps. We'll just do a continuous scale like this, which is a little bit more interesting to see. And that's it. That's our little heat map, okay? Very easy to do. Right, let's go to uh, uh, heat, uh, maps are pretty exciting. So let's go to heat, uh, let's call this heat map. And um, Okay, so the the steps are just related to how many different gradients you want in the color. That's it. So um, here at the moment, you see there is no steps. Okay, so the color range just goes from left to right in a continuous uh, range. As soon as I hit stepped color, five steps just means I get five separations in the color. And if I bump up the steps, I get more individual steps uh, in this particular color. Okay, so if I hit five, you'll see that Tableau does its best job to kind of put things in specific steps, but it tells you where the first, uh, well, 
by the left hand side is starts and the right side ends but you might not have anything that takes up those specific spaces that's why i sometimes think it's better just to do a continuous scale because then everything kind of has a purposeful color and it allows me to even see for example that you know these uh, where i'm looking here these two uh, perform slightly differently but i know that this is also worse than that so it just makes it easy to kind of see where everything is so um that's that's basically what the steps do if that makes sense okay cool right um hi elaine and um, welcome good vibes indeed <laughs> um right so what i was trying to do is build maps so maps are super easy in tableau right um maps are probably one of the interesting the, the the mapping capability in tableau can in some cases make you know purpose-built mapping technology look really bad because of the way tableau is dynamic and it allows you to connect to data okay so you might say that, look, okay, I've connected to this data set and I've got no, you know, no mapping information. So how on earth is Tableau going to draw a map? Well, anytime you connect to a data set and Tableau is able to recognize a certain set of values from the data set, for example, if I have a column called city or country or region, what Tableau will do is it will look inside of that column and read all the values. And if it can figure out that the values in there relate to a city and or country region that it's aware of in its data set, then it actually assigns this globe icon to let you know that it thinks this field is actually playing a geographical role. And that geographical role, you can find out what it is by going to this little drop down, selecting geographical role, and it tells you right there that Tableau thinks that this country and region field means country and region. It's guessed that because that's what it's called. But in some cases, you could have called this region, but it could still come in here and say country region. Okay. And the city, if you go look at that, has a geographical role of city. Now, other things that Tableau is aware of, if you have a list of airports, area codes, this is mostly US centric. Um, but if you have a list of those, then Tableau is able to sort of recognize them just built in. And in terms of global data sets, um, for example, here in the UK, it does understand postcodes. So it's able to use uh, that zip code or postcode. And I think Tableau is aware of pretty much every city that has a population of uh, over 100,000 people. Um, I think, I can't remember if that's actually correct. I need to sort of check my facts, but I'm pretty sure that it has a pretty good database globally of towns and cities that meet a certain population level. Okay. And so to draw a map, it's literally this simple. You just double click the item and Tableau will just go ahead and plot them for you and build a map. Okay, that's it. That's that's as simple as it is. Now, it's maybe not the map you're expecting. And so we'll get to the different types of maps. But there I clicked city. And so it just gave me all the cities that it, it found. Now, there is a catch there because this doesn't look correct. This is a large data set. I've only got 49 data points on here. What's going on? Well, with maps, it's super important, super important to pay attention to what's going on down here on the bottom right. Because what Tableau is telling you here is it doesn't know where 493 data points should go. And so often I see maps where people haven't actually recognized this and they're wondering why they can't see the rest of their data. So if we click on this 493 unknown, Tableau gives you three options. You can edit the location, you can remove the data, or we can show the data at default position, which is going to be zero, zero, which is near the equator. You don't want that. So if you go and edit the locations, Tableau says, hey, look, the country and region is the United Kingdom. The state and province, I don't know what that should be. So what you can do is you can tell Tableau what these things should be. So the country and region, instead of being the United Kingdom, I can actually say, go and get that from a field. And this time, the field uh, that you're going to use is going to be this one, country region. And then the state and province, I don't actually have one. So we're just going to select none. And the city, that works out pretty well. Okay, so if I go here, you can see it's still not perfect. So let me, um, let me reset the matches and just uh, double check this. So we've got the country and region, that's fine. The state and province, interesting. Uh, oh, no, we do have a field for this. We do have a field for this. Um, I forgot that we have this state and province field right here. If you didn't have that, Tableau would have to ask you like which country you're in. And that's where you'd basically then go and lock that in and say, we're going to be in this fixed country. And so try and match the cities in this country. But for this one, I can actually just match it to the country and region, state and province. 
And now you can see that the errors that were here have completely gone. Everything is nice and good. We're pretty much ready to go. If I go look at the cities, I can see the individual matches that it's manually done. In the event you have a city that's new and it's not on here, it will actually give you the option to edit the location and you can give it the latitude and longitude for that location. You can just hit the drop down and you know enter the latitude and pretty much put it in yourself if it doesn't exist. Uh, hit OK. And notice that now we're actually visualizing this correctly. So it first drew the map in the UK, completely wrong. The correct place is actually to do it here in the United States. And so this is our map. And this map is essentially showing us uh, the point of each particular cell. Okay, so we can see that that works nicely. One of the things we might want to do is change the size of these dots to match the cells. So I can go ahead and drag cells onto size. That will match each dot with the size of the cells in that in that particular location. You'll see some dots completely shrink to basically nothing, but it kind of shows you where the, the real business is happening. And you can then go ahead and actually drag the size up just so you don't lose some of that detail in the smaller in the smaller locations. And what I find good to do in a map like this is I like to go to the color uh, pane and I put a border of white because maps are sort of confusing. And when you have overlaying points, if they don't have a border, it's hard to see what's going on. So I like to put a white border on the map so everything is much easier to see. And the final thing you can do is you can actually change the background map. I think this is a pretty good one, but you can change this background to be a different map by going up to map. And you can see you've got different options here. So you've got background maps, light, normal, dark, street, outdoor, satellite, offline, whatever. So let's go to light. This is the one we're on. Let's go to normal. This is what actually typically Tableau will use, especially when you don't have an internet connection. This is actually what it will default to. Uh, dark is sort of like a dark version of the map. And you notice how uh, the, the data points look a bit different here. Uh, streets. I'm only showing you this because I think it's good to know that they exist. So I'm just kind of giving you the full contrast. Now, um, the nice thing about some of these, especially the map box one, which is what this street map is, is that it's vector uh, maps. So we might be looking at a whole country level here, but let's say I was to zoom in. Let's can I can I zoom in? Yeah, we can. Uh, which way am I zooming in? And uh, this way is the zoom in. I'm trying to figure out which way is zoom on my mouse. Um, just so we can see. And as we zoom in, can you notice the um, the level of detail increases on the map? So the detail that you get on the map is relevant to your zoom level. And for some of these, if I just go into Washington, there's, a, there's one cell here in Washington. Um, it takes a little time for the map information to load, but the mapping detail is pretty detailed. I'd be surprised that if you went to your home region, you wouldn't have, for example, all the individual walkways going through a park. It's 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 incredibly detailed. And if I even go right down, you can even see little monuments and everything that you'd expect. So tableau mapping is incredibly powerful. Uh, the next one I'll go to, just to sort of show this off one last time, is satellite. And the satellite imagery, again, from Mapbox is pretty good. Here you can even see uh, individual trucks and you can see the Washington Monument right there. So uh, super, super cool. Um, what I'll do though is I'll go back to just a boring old normal map and this will allow us to go back to the normal zoom level. Now what I want to do is I want to zoom back out to see everything. So if I hover my mouse here you can uh, it disappears so let's not do that. So if I just move my mouse here you can see where my mouse is right now. Um, if I untick that it resets the map to have everything in the visualization. And this little toolbar is called the mapping toolbar, essentially. You can customize how it works and everything. Um, you can even choose what to show and what to hide. Uh, I won't do that here, but you've got a few controls. One of them is the ability to zoom. So if I wanted to zoom into, let's say, this group of cells, I could just do that by highlighting them like that. And then I get the zoom zooming into that level. I'll go back to the left-hand side, uncheck that pin. It goes back to the full zoom level. Okay. So that's one type of map. We'll call this a dot map, uh, let's say. Um, now, maybe I want to do a different kind of map. Maybe I want to do a filled map where each state is filled, okay? So let's go ahead and double click state and province and you'll see that uh, it struggles again. And the reason is because we haven't actually given this specific uh, field a geographical role. We told it what that field was here, but then we weren't giving it a geographical role. We were telling it what it is, okay? 
So let's just go to this little drop down and let's go to geographical role. And it is actually selecting state and province. But the issue is it doesn't know which, um, probably doesn't know which country it is. It, it keeps thinking I'm in the UK. It's just not correct. So we'll just tell it to use the country and region and select OK. Um, this might happen to you as well. And there you go. You'll see each and every um, uh, area filled. What is really interesting about this is that I didn't know that this Superstore data set now includes Canada. That's uh, really strange, but okay. <laughs> um, it's never included Canada before. I've just noticed that now that we have all the sort of Canadian states up here. But anyway, we've got a dot map again. We don't want the dot map. We want a filled map. So each of these states should be a filled border. Okay. Well, you see, again, the automatic is playing its role here. It's changing the chart type depending on what it thinks works best. But if instead of a dot or circle, I end up going down here to a map, you get a filled map. And now each state is filled, okay? Obviously, it's good to have labels on these. So I can drag state and put it back on the label. And now each of these will be labeled really nicely. And I can do things like uh, color it. So I can, color, I can color this by profit, actually. So you can drag the profit, put it on color. And again, we get our little coloring to show us how profitable everything is, okay? Super simple, nice and easy, sort of no complex uh, situations, yeah? Now, um, at the very beginning of the stream yesterday, I showed you um, a colleague of mine who managed to put both the dot map and the fill map on top of each other, okay? So how do we do that? Well, for your benefit, let me just create this again. So I'll double click state and province. It will complain saying it doesn't know what the locations are. I'm going down here to the bottom right hand side, edit locations. I'm telling it that the country and region definitions should come from a specific field called country and region. Okay. And I can't really show you this, but this country and region field is this field. If you don't have that country and region field, what you could do is you can specifically tell it which country to use or just completely tell it to ignore the country and it will do its best to match everything. But for now we can actually use the country and region. You've got a couple of other um, bits of information and standards, but it's not really relevant for this particular crash course. Go ahead and click OK. Everything's working fine. Go ahead, set up a field map. Then we got our first map ready to go. Okay. Now, our second map, it's a little bit more complex because what we need to do is essentially add the same map in again. And that's a little bit trickier to do because if I just go and double click, let's say city, well, it changes the map. So how do we do that? How do we get the maps on top of each other? Well, for that, what you want to do is drag latitude next to latitude again, and longitude next to longitude again. And what that does is it gives us four maps, even more confusing. <laughs> and then once we've done that, we can go and use a technique we've been using already called dual axis. So go ahead and select dual axis and select dual axis for both of those. What that does is it puts both maps on top of each other. But as you've known, whenever you've got two things on top of each other, each of them gets their own formatting pane on the left-hand side. So what I can do with this top one is I can go to this one and tell it to be a circle. And I can go to the bottom one, and that can be a filled map. Okay. And I think the way I've done this, I've got them the wrong way around. So what I'll do is I'll actually swap that around. I'll say, look, the bottom one can be a circle. The top one can be a filled map. And I think that works a little bit better because, yeah, I can see that this circle is now on top. Okay. Now, what we'll do with the map, uh, this one over here, is I'll go ahead and color that by profit. Okay. And now you can see the dots a bit more clearly. And then for the dot, I'll click on that. I'll set the dot to white. And now that dot becomes almost like a nice stylistic element that we can use to convey other bits of information. Uh, Priya, in her visualization, used it to convey the cells. So the size of the circle referenced the cells. And so if I just bump that up, uh, let's just bump it down, actually. Let's just bump it down. You kind of have to play with this until you're kind of happy. Then um, you kind of get a good feel for what's uh, going on. Let me just set a nice dark border on these so they're easy to see. And then for my scale up here, I, I don't like the uh, sort of red to blue uh, scale. So what I'll do is I'll go double click on the, the legend to give us this color uh, view. And then I'll go ahead and select the blue and hit apply. So the darker the blue, the more profitable. And that's not even close to what Preya did, but it's a similar kind of chart. And now you can see kind of what you can do with this and you can apply it, style it and do whatever you want to it. 
Um, again, don't forget you can add labels. So in this particular case, I can go ahead and add the labels to this. And it works. You know, it's a bit messy, but depending on what you're showing, it might kind of work out. Now, the other thing not to forget is that this circle doesn't have to be at the same level of detail as your states. So here we've got states, but the circles could actually represent cities instead. I could just drag city, put it on detail, and now you'll get more dots, one for each city. And that allows you to sort of overlay the two on top of each other. So depending on the story you're trying to tell, you need to make some design choices, some stylistic choices, and some formatting choices. But if you make the right ones, you can bring a combination of these two to build yourself a really powerful map, okay? And so that is a pretty, I think, detailed enough introduction to maps just to get you going and get you started and sort of to understand how it works, all right? So we've done a filled map. Uh, we've done a dot map. Oh, spatial data. You know, this is a bit advanced, but I will show it anyway. Um, spatial data, when you connect to a data type, if I just click on this little Tableau logo, yeah, when you click on that, it goes back to the connection window we had at the very beginning. And you can see that one of the types of files you can connect to is spatial, okay? And spatial files, if I click on that, uh, are typically known as these file types you can see here. So if you know that you're getting spatial data from a system, then uh, you can go ahead and use this type. If you don't have access to any spatial data, I recommend you go to any government website that has open data sources. For example, in London, you can go to, uh, there's, a data, there's a London data store that has data from councils. Uh, in America, I know New York have a New York open data initiative where you can go and download spatial data that tells you, for example, the location of trees. That's actually a data set I used in the most recent video explaining a new feature in Tableau, so go ahead and check that out. But once you download that data, you'll notice that it comes in one of these particular file formats, either a zip file, a shape file. And once you've got those file types, you can go ahead and connect to them. I'll show you a very brief example just to show you what that file looks like. So for example, here, I have a folder that has the waterways in London and uh, the shape file, it ends in a .shp. And you can see that's this file here that's leveled, okay? So the, the thing about spatial files is that this file isn't actually the only file that's required. All of these files are important because they tell the file different things about where the uh, individual um, bits of information are. So whenever you see a shape file, don't delete the other files that come with it. Keep it together or zip it up and Tableau can open both of those, okay? So let's go ahead and open the London waterways. And as soon as we open that up, you'll see that it loads up the connection window we've seen already. I'll go to a brand new sheet. Let's go to sheet number 16. And you can see uh, this is my data, okay? We're, uh, WFD London, that's the waterways. So you're probably wondering, well, what makes this spatial data? What makes this different? You just got a bunch of fields. Uh, you've got a country field, that's nothing special. Well, spatial data tends to con contain what is called a geometry. And a geometry is something uh, like this. You'll see that it says geometry and it has a globe icon. And the thing about geometries is they contain either polygons, uh, lines, or points. So points are just latitude and longitude. A line is maybe the, the road. A road network could be lines. A river network could be lines. And polygons tend to be the shape of boundaries. For example, the state boundaries are polygons and uh, city boundaries are polygons, okay? And so when you double click those geometry, Tableau actually draws whatever's behind that geometry. So in this particular setup, these are the different waterways that lead up to the River Thames in London. So if I actually go back to my map and I just bring on the street view, you can see that this is indeed London. And um, when I hover over one of the geometries, it highlights everything. But the reason that is because I haven't told Tableau that I need to add more detail. So what I need to do is uh, go and get the name of the uh, waterways. And now when I hover over one of them, you see that it only selects that particular one. And the reason you might want to visualize these is maybe you're telling a story about the waterways in London and the quality. And so you need to go get the shape file that has the waterways. Then you need to go get the data that links to those waterways. You can bring them together inside a Tableau. That's a bit advanced. We're not going to do that in this crash course, but you bring them together using a union or a join or something fairly straightforward. And then you can visualize that information quite nicely here in Tableau. So that's why you'd use a shapefile and that's why you'd kind of be doing this here inside a Tableau. So 
Um, I've just sort of shown you that so you know what to go and Google what to search for. Um, if you look at sort of demos that I've done on new features, you'll see the techniques you need to kind of do all of this. So just look through the channel, look through other videos. Um, if I can suggest one person, if you do nothing else, um, go and look for a chap called Mark Reed. And his YouTube channel is a, a friend of mine. And he also has a great YouTube channel. He has done some absolutely, absolutely fantastic videos in general about Tableau, but he's also very good at explaining spatial features in Tableau. So you can look at some of the uh, formulas and calculations and how he's setting these up. And he's got a really good storytelling method as well as how to, how to sort of bring these two together. So go check out his videos and follow his channel. It's a really, really good resource for this particular kind of analysis, okay? Um, but for now, we'll just leave that at that. We'll leave uh, the mapping there. What I'll do is I'll put this file that I've downloaded here in the description along with this video so you can download it and try it as well, okay? Good, right. Um, excellent, let's keep pushing. So we've got spatial data. Um, I think I've shown you how to style maps a little bit. We kind of played around with the coloring on this tab. Uh, we did a bunch of different things and it was all good. So again, for a crash course, I think this is all you really need. I mean, if you turn up and after you know watching this uh, course, you can do this kind of stuff. You'll be blowing people's minds if it's just the first time you've used Tableau. So we'll keep this uh, simple for now and we'll move on, okay? Um, uh, da, 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 da. The oh, this is where I get to tell you why I don't like if uh, a specific feature. Yeah, and this is called show me. Okay, um, uh, Andre, I've seen your question. I'll get back to that just in a, in a second. Okay, so um, something really common when people use Tableau is uh, this thing up here. Let me just show you this. This thing called show me. Okay, I hate this with a passion. I hate when I see people using this. And if you use it right now, that's totally fine. I, I'm not here to sort of say you shouldn't use it or whatever. But the reason I hate it is because I don't think Tableau have built it well enough to really help people understand what it's actually trying to get you to do, okay? The purpose of the show me tool is to help you understand how to build a specific chart. So if I go ahead and click on it, uh, I don't know if you know this, you can actually drag it and move it wherever you want. Not many people know that either, so you can click on it, but not many people think to just drag it and put it wherever they want. So let's say we drag it and put it here on the left. When I hover over these different charts, can you see that it tells you what you need on the bottom to get it to work, okay? And, you know, this is, this is literally telling you how to build a chart. And I have no issue with you using this if you could create the chart yourself without using this because then you're using as a shortcut. Let's call it like a, a keyboard shortcut to get to a chart type really quickly. But in my, in my experience as a trainer, I've trained thousands of people. I've taught many people here on YouTube. I've even seen other people training Tableau on YouTube in other tutorials, showing people how to use this and then telling people the wrong thing because they're using Show Me as a starting point and then they don't know how they've got themselves into that position and they end up just basically clicking around until they get everything how they want it. But they've done it in a really cumbersome way, a way that would have taken less time if they just knew how to build charts. That is why up until now, I have not used Show Me to show you how to build any of these charts. All of these charts, we've done them, and I've tried to explain the mechanics of how the charts work. Because if you understand the mechanics, you can customize them and just notice that many of them don't have more than five things here in the in the view, okay? Very few things. However, if you use Show Me, more often than not, it uses more than is required. So let's let's just have a go at using it so you can kind of see that play out. So here, let's say uh, we want to build a pie chart. We need one dimension and two, one or two measures. So what you can do with this, you can select a dimension. So let's say we're gonna select category. And notice when I select it, it sort of lights up on the right-hand side to show you what you can use. And I'm going to hold um, command and select sales. And you see, as soon as I select sales and category, all the charts that I can build with those two things turn up, okay? So if I select tree map, you'll see that it builds a tree map that I showed you how to build. And this is a tree map that it built. Now, it did that in two, well, I'll say three clicks. So I held city, sales, and um, then I came here and I selected tree map, and then it built it, okay? If you go look at my tree map, okay, mine's a bit more complex because we added stuff to it. 
but ultimately it's exactly the same chart. So all the same mechanics are just being built. And so what 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 I wish Xiaomi did is instead of just putting everything on the visualization, because notice notice what it did in one sweep. There's nothing on the visualization. City sells. There's absolutely nothing. You click tree map and boom, it just turns up. And and now it actually built something different, which is also really frustrating. Like sometimes, oh, because I selected city, not category. Fine. But it's just so so jarring experience because it doesn't actually show you what it's doing. So if you're going to use Show Me, pay attention to how it's building that chart for you. Let's take one more example. Let's clear the sheet. Let's take a uh, category, uh, product. Uh, let's take, sorry, product and sales. Okay. And it says we can draw a box plot. So let's go ahead and do that. And boom, it, it creates one of these. Now, people get frustrated because it they wanted a box plot, but they didn't know they needed to add subcategory to have it split out and sort of create something nicer. So another problem with Show Me is it doesn't guide you through the question you're trying to answer because what you really needed to do is you needed to select product, sales, and then subcategory, then come here to the uh, box plot, and it would have built something that we built before. Okay, and we built it. Maybe that one was a little bit sort of uh, faster than us doing it, but. You see, now that you've got this, if I asked you, how do you customize this? If you've only ever used Show Me to get here, you wouldn't know, basically. You wouldn't know that if I right click on the axis, edit the reference line, then go to the box plot, I have all of these settings available. And that's my sort of gripe with Show Me. So if you're using Show Me and this is how you work, totally fine. I have no issue with it whatsoever. But just remember that it's trying to show you how to use the chart. So pay attention to what it's doing. When I go and create a chart, let's say I bring, um, sales and let's say this time category and I create a bubble chart. What has it done? It's created three circles, but how has it done it? Well, instead of a square, which gives us a tree map, it's changed it to a circle, which gives us a bubble map. That is it. That's as simple as that. So now you know that if I go back to my tree map, what happens if I change this to a circle? Well, I get a bubble map. Dead simple. So now you know that mechanic. If you're building this chart, and you don't like what you're looking at, and someone says, oh, can you just make that a bubble chart? Instead of going back and selecting all the things to get it back to where you did, like maybe six or seven steps, you just go in here like a boss, hit circle, and you're done, okay? <laughs> so that's my little sort of rant against uh, Shobi done. I'll never talk about it again. That's it for this crash course, okay? So um, Diablo, they do tell you it's the easiest way to use it. <laughs> It's, uh, it's, 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 uh, it drives me nuts, but yeah, anyway. Right. So listen, we've built a bunch of stuff here and you're probably wondering, well, how do I see all this wonderful stuff that I've built? Is there a way I can see each and every one of these views easily and, uh, then allow sort of you to kind of have an overview of all the charts you've built. There is actually a way, not many people know about this either. Just down here, it's just the tiniest thing. I'm going to, I'm going to, in, in the edit, I'll have to zoom into this section and just show it to you. You've got three icons. The one we're in at the moment is the one on the right hand side. If I select the second to last one, you notice that it shows me the visualizations along the bottom, but still keeps them as tabs. So I can go through the tabs as I was doing before. This is kind of handy if you want to see the charts that you're using, make it sort of really nice to browse. The one I like is actually this grid one here at the bottom. So this very final one. If I click on that, it gives me this. And this allows me to see all the things I've built. And it's nice because I get an overview. If I want to quickly go and see where is that chart that I built? Oh, I built five variants of it. It's just all here and it's really nice. And here's a little trick. Not many people know this either. When you open a workbook for the first time, let's say you become Tableau sort of professional or whatever, you've done your certifications, you're using Tableau every single day. When you open your workbook for the first time, what Tableau hasn't done is hasn't loaded all the visualizations. So you'll go to each tab and it will still be loading the visualization. And here's the trick. If you come to this tab, right click, then select refresh thumbnails. That has the effect of loading every single tab in one go. Okay. And that is often faster than going to each of them separately and getting it to load. So if you're trying to get everything to load quickly, this is the way to do it. And this is why I'm showing it to you. Okay. To go back to an individual chart, you just go back down here and select one of the views you want. And there you go. Pretty much good to go. Okay, so we've done some charts. Everything's looking good. Um, we're basically kind of now getting familiar with the mechanics of how to build charts in Tableau. 
Now we need to start sort of building a story. And to do that in Tableau, there's a couple of ways. Um, essentially, it's called a dashboard. And dashboards bring together some of these charts into one sort of story, okay? So how do we create a new dashboard? Well, if I go to, um, well, <laughs> let, me, let, me re let me start again. Because I have this um, view here where I can see an image for each tab, the settings for creating a dashboard are squashed to this very right-hand side. So you have the option for a new sheet, a new dashboard, and a new story. We're not going to cover stories in this crash course. It's kind of rarely used, but again, there's lots of videos out there for it. I'm just going to use dashboard and sheets. If I go back to the view I had before, then that option is here and here. And the less you have in a workbook, the more these settings kind of move around. So before we had lots of things in our dashboard or in our view, it actually, these options were all the way to the left-hand side, okay? But let's go ahead and select the second one to create a new dashboard. And you'll see that it gives us a canvas, okay? Now this canvas is just a blank canvas. We can go ahead and do a couple of things with it. But if I hover over these uh, charts, you can see all the charts we've created are just here on the left-hand side. So what you can evidently do is you can bring these into this canvas and you're pretty much ready to go. You can build your dashboard. Now, dashboarding in Tableau is probably the most time-consuming part of Tableau. And I'm not proud of this. I'm not proud of Tableau that this is this is the most time-consuming part because I've had plenty of opportunities to sort of address this and make it easy for people. So this is probably where people get the most frustrated with Tableau because things you think that are straightforward just appear not to be straightforward. So to simplify it, I recommend you do a couple of things when you're building your first dashboard. Keep the dashboard simple. Don't try and bring too many things in at once. So for this one, I'm just going to double click the tree map. You'll see it comes in. I will bring the uh, dot map. I'll double click that. And you'll see it when I double click them, it brings them in. Absolutely fine. And then the last thing I'll do is probably bring in the line chart. Okay. So I've, I've brought three things in. Now, when I double click them, it brings everything in. So you can see the formatting on this is a bit janky. It's not nice. We've got the legend over here. It's a little bit of broken dashboard, isn't it? It's not it's not sort of not a nice aesthetic. And we want to kind of change this. And what we should do is we should, what I start to do is I just clear the dashboards completely with legends. I can bring the legends back very easily. I'll show you how. So I just go ahead and select them one by one and I clean them out. Okay, that gives the dashboard a bit more space. The next thing I decide is how big the dashboard should be. So if you're building this in an organization, the dashboard size, in my opinion, should be one of two things. It should always represent the smallest size that someone's really going to realistically use. So typically laptops. And the second thing, it should never be automatic or user range. And this is an advanced topic, but long story short, if it's automatic or user range, the performance will be worse. Just a fact. I can tell you why in another video, but automatic and or range dashboards do create worse performance because Tableau can't pre-render the visualization to suit every single screen size. Okay, you just can't do that. It can't know what screen size someone's laptop's going to be. So these two will impact performance. So I always use a fixed size. Uh, people will have aesthetic reasons for changing it. You might get clients who will say, hey, I'd like it to fill my screen. Well, yes, in an ideal world, but no, this is Tableau. So let's just keep it simple. The next thing I'll do is the width. I normally go to about 1-200. That, that to me is like the optimal size. People have decent laptops now. They have decent screens at work. You know, 1-200 works pretty well. You can see it fits on my screen with plenty of space all the way around. And 800 vertical as well is kind of good. I could go to 900, but 800 is just like a nice proportion. So now that I've got the spacing correct, I can now start to move things around. And to do this, the simplest thing to do is just to grab the chart and move it to where you want. And you see Tableau will kind of highlight things for you. So if I move it up to the top, it says it's going to take the whole entire width. And it goes ahead and does that. And the tree map here, I want to put it to the right-hand side of the line chart. So I'll just grab it and put it down here. And there you go. Okay. And that is, again, for your first dashboard, that's as simple as it needs to be. Now, when you want to go ahead and do more advanced techniques and tricks, you're going to have to start getting familiar with something called layout containers. And layout containers are essentially boxes where you can put charts in and then move things around in containers. I've done a, a whole video on this. If you just Google uh, layout containers on Tableau, I've done 
um, a video on this. Multiple people have done videos on this, actually. So I've done a 10-minute video, 73,000 views. That shows you how big of an issue this is. And it explains layout containers in a nutshell. Very simple, very, it's very sort of um, easy to do, okay? So go ahead and check that video out. I'm not going to cover it here because it's just something that I think um, isn't necessary for a crash course. You don't need to be a layout container master for your first dashboard. Now, the last thing I'd want to do, you can see the line chart, the tree map, all of these are great. The last thing I want to do is maybe bring in a title. So over here on the left-hand side, you can see I can bring in a bunch of other things. Uh, text is going to allow me to bring the title. So I'll just bring it to the top. We'll call this, this is my title, okay? And again, you're just trying to get something that looks good for your first dashboard. And you're not trying to, uh, you know, come out with the stops and have like a kick-ass design. Just keep it simple for your first dashboard. Um, you might decide to maybe make this larger. There you go. And there you go, done. Now, there is actually another way of bringing the title. I completely forgot about it. So I, I'm like, go on then, I'll show you this. Um, down here, you can see this is this, this dashboard is called Dashboard 1, okay? And if I'm, if I'm correct, if I go back to Dashboard up here, I can see there's an option here to show the title. And that show title will get the title from the name that you've given down here, okay? So if I go ahead and rename this and call this uh, my first dashboard. Okay, then you see that the title is there and then you no longer need this text box. The nice thing about this title is it's known as a dashboard title, therefore it gets formatting like a dashboard title. And if you go to the format and you go to dashboard, all these options observe the different things that you set up. So the dashboard title, for example, we can go in here, set it to red, and uh, you can change it however you want. The worksheet titles, which are these ones, you can change those all in unison, make them really nice, and um, essentially just start to style this out a little bit nicer, okay? So there you go, there's your first dashboard. Super simple, no interactivity, it's just a dashboard. You put the picture, everything is on there. The last things we can do is make sure everything fills the space. So this tree map doesn't quite go all the way to the end, so let's go ahead and go to that, select fit the width, and it will see it'll just fit the space. Uh, this one, we've set it to entire view already, and so has the map. Perfect. That's all we really need. We don't need much more than that. And for me, I'd say this is, this is for your first dashboard, this is perfect. My first dashboard was 100 times worse than this. I was trying to find the image for this, and I, I couldn't find the image. I do have the image somewhere, but I, I just couldn't find where I've stored it. So if I find the image, I will, I'll will i probably do a video on my first dashboard. You can see how bad my first dashboard was. It was 10 times worse than this, okay? <laughs> so if you if you kind of achieve anything better than this, you're already starting off on a much better path than even I did. And, and you know, seven years down the line, who knows where you'll be. The final thing that I want to show you with this dashboard, um, you want to add some interactivity to the dashboard. You want to make this so that when I click on something here, it changes the other, the other charts, okay? The quickest way to do this as a beginner is when you click on each chart, you see that you get this little um, admin pane that kind of turns up on the right-hand side. You get this gray border around the whole thing, and then on the right-hand side, you get this ability to add some items. The one you want to select is this one, Use as Filter. What that will do is it will make your chart behave like a filter. We've not done filters yet, but I'll show you those in a second. When we do them, that it means this chart can now control these two visualizations. And to show you that, I'll just go ahead and highlight these two. And you'll see that both the tree maps change to reflect my selection, okay? If I don't drag anything, maybe I'm just clicking around. You can see that the maps, everything, the line charts are changing to reflect that change, okay? And when I deselect everything, it goes back to the default. Now, these line charts here aren't doing the same thing. So to make those do the same thing, I can just select Users Filter. And in fact, I can actually do this with the tree map as well. Select that. And now every single visualization affects other visualizations here. So if I want to look at this technology sector and see where those sales are spread, you can see the trend line for that and also the interactivity at the top. Uh, you can select the office supplies and it changes the visualization. Okay. So this is an interactive dashboard doing uh, a couple of absolutely fantastic things. It's filtering and it's basically adapting to everything that you've set up, okay? Now, the way that is working is using this little icon, but that icon 
adds what's known as a filter action. A filter action is essentially an action that adds a filter to a specific sheet. So if I was to select this New York City item, for example, then I go to my tree map and instead of going back to it here on the bottom, I can actually go directly to it by hitting this square. Okay, so I go to the square. You'll notice if you look very closely that it's now added something called an action. So this is what I mean by filter action. When we were clicking the charts, that creates a filter action and that actually sends an instruction to Tableau to add a filter up here to the filters pane. And so that maybe makes you wonder, well, how do I add my own filters to this? Okay. Well, I can go ahead and remove this filter action. You'll see it goes back to how it should look like when we built it. I can close the formatting pane. And then on the left-hand side, we can actually go and get anything we want. In this case, let me just go and get the category so it's super clear that I'm filtering a specific color out. I can drag the category onto filters and you'll see you get this win window. Now, this filters pane is really advanced. I don't have time to cover everything here, but just know that you can filter in lots of different ways using wildcard searches, conditional statements, and even uh, top and bottom filters set up in lots of different ways. But we don't have time to cover all of that. We'll just stick to the basic ones. If I deselect furniture and hit apply, you'll see that it filters out the blue item. And so you probably want to see, well, how do I make this an interface element? Okay. Well, if I remove this category again, just to bring everything back, the quickest way to add a filter is to actually select right click and show filter. Because what that does is it adds the filter. It doesn't give us that interface and it also gives us the filter on the right hand side. And this allows us to go ahead and control it. So I can now just select items like so, and you can see the filters working as I expected. And if you filter everything out, obviously you get nothing in your chart. So this is exactly how it works, okay? So that is working nicely. So then you're probably wondering, well, how do I change the way this filter looks? Well, if you click on this little arrow on the right hand side, you have a range of options. You can do the single value lists where you can only choose one at a time, okay? Uh, that's a specific style you might go for. You might choose a drop down list and um, where you can choose multiple values like this, where you can go ahead and select two or more values or as many as you want. All of these stylings just live here on the right hand side. So play around with these, see what they do, learn how they work. Now, the other thing, oh, what did I just do there? What did I just do there? Okay, include values, sorry. Um, the other thing I did right there that I didn't mean to do, I wasn't going to cover, but now I've done it, I have to explain it to you, <laughs> is the filters can flip the way they work. So at the moment, anything you tick is going to be shown in the visualization, but I can actually flip it the other way around. So now anything I select gets removed. So you can invert the way the filter works just by ticking these two options here at the bottom, include or exclude. That flips the way the filter works, you see? Right, the very final thing is if I go back to my dashboard, now you're probably wondering, well, how do I bring the filter here? I'd like to use the filter on this page so users can change how things work. So let me go ahead and go to this little uh, toolbar and you'll see you get a bunch of new options just for this chart, one of which is a filter and I can go ahead and choose the filter that I want. In this case, it's going to be category. And as soon as I select it, you see it shows up up here. Now, when I select it, this is great, but it's not affecting the whole visualization. So how do I get it to do that? Well, if I select the drop down for this, you can see that I get this option to apply to worksheets. And there's a couple of options here, but actually if I select apply to worksheets and go across, you can see there's an option here for selected worksheets. And all you wanna do is select that. And then you can go to this option here that says select all on this dashboard. So on this dashboard, there's three charts. And if I go ahead and tick it, you'll see that it puts a tick next to each of those, okay? The thing to remember with this filter is that it belongs to the tree map, okay? So you can see the tree map is grayed out. That's how you know it belongs to the tree map. If you ever wonder where the filters have gone, why they're not working, just make sure they belong to the right chart because that might be what's actually controlling everything, okay? So go ahead and select okay. And now my filters affect everything, okay? I've got this selection here for some bizarre reason. Um, but yeah, now my filters affect absolutely everything and I can use this filter to switch on categories. Now I'm only looking at uh, office supplies, but again, if I click on different elements, uh, then I can see the sort of behavior work, okay? 
So this is a really nice feature set because it allows you to do a couple of different things. It makes the dynamic really interactive and it makes it super, um, you know, sort of valuable, okay? So the more da the more filters you add, the more sort of control you're giving users, but don't get too trigger happy with filters. It, it, they all can, you know, too many filters can slow a dashboard down. I've seen people with workbooks with 10 filters. That's too many. In my opinion, about five is the absolute max. If you need more, Maybe you need to work more with these kinds of interactions where you're clicking something on the chart to do the filtering rather than having the filter shown on the page. Okay, good work. So we have brought our uh, charts together. Let's just go and uh, strike that. Making dashboards interactive. Okay. The thing, oh, calculations and functions. Hmm. We haven't needed to do this yet. And it, okay. So with calculations and functions in Tableau, two, two things are important. Earlier on, let's go back to where we had a uh, box bullet chart. So when we, when we created this chart, we created a calculation for sales plus 20%. And for that value, we did this calculation, okay? And the only thing I want to cover in this uh, specific lesson for this particular thing is the types of calculations. So row level versus aggregate calculation. Uh, hold on, let's just look at the question from Diablo, uh, Diablo, which I think is important to filtering. Would you say it's better to better practice to just let them filter from the dashboard versus adding the filter or is it case by case? Um, it's definitely case by case. Often someone's going to be telling you what they want, um, but it's also a real little bit about user experience and user design. So try and do the best thing that works the mess easiest way. One of the things you'll find is as you build dashboards, things don't work the way you think they're going to work once people start using them. So just pay attention to how people are using them and you'll get the answer very quickly. Okay. So back to row level calculations versus aggregate calculations. And the best way to show you this is to Weirdly, go to Excel. <laughs> so over here, I have uh, I have another computer running and um, Microsoft Office, and um, I have a backup computer which I've remoted into that I always have. And um, in this particular setup, what I want to do is just clear this, okay? And we're just going to do some simple maths. And the reason I'm doing this is to show you the difference between a row level calculation and an aggregate calculation. And this is important just for calculations. And you're going to probably need to do calculations yourself when you're setting things up. So that's why I want to show you this. Okay. So let's say we have some fruits. Okay. And uh, we have a customer. And we have John who buys an apple and a pear. Uh, he buys a quantity. Uh, two, one, that will do. Then we have Lucy, let's say, uh, very, <laughs> very simple names. Who buys an orange and she buys uh, five, okay? And uh, we have the quantity and then we have what I'm going to say the total price, okay? So total of what they've bought. So we can actually maybe put a pound sign. This might seem like really basic stuff to you, but just... Bear with me while I explain this because it's super important. Okay. So if total price they pay, let's say two pounds, four pounds, eight, seven pounds, just arbitrary prices. Okay. So then comes the analytical questions. All right. And the first analytical question you might want to answer is, you know, what's the average price of each fruit? Okay. And to do that, you could probably just take, um, uh, well, for each fruit, the average, the price is just going to be uh, this divided by that. So the total total cost divided by the quantity. So let's go ahead and do that. So we can say this equals uh, that divided by that. Okay, and that gives you the price. And we can go ahead and fill down. So price per fruit. And that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, hopefully you guys are still following along. And that was called a row level calculation because what we did is we for each line, so for this is line one, for line two, line three, what we did is we did a calculation that checked the total, divided it by the quantity, which gives us the price per fruit, okay? 
Now, the problem you have is that in Tableau, there's two ways of specifying a calculation. And people get confused which way they should do it and which way they shouldn't. And it gets more interesting if I was to ask you, well, what is the total, um, what is the average price of each transaction? So a transaction belongs to one customer. So you can see here, you've got the customer, John, who buys two, has two rows in the same, in the same sort of thing. And the reason he has two rows is because this data set is happening at the fruit level of detail. So it's happening, each fruit get it, gets its own line. So there's actually only two customers. And so for each transaction, the total, what we have to do is we actually have to end up adding these two. So six plus, um, four plus two is six, and then seven plus six gives us the total, okay? So the average transaction price would actually be four plus two, which would be uh, six, and then six plus seven divided by two, because it's actually only two transactions. That is an aggregate calculation, because what we're doing is we're adding up everything in the column. If I was to go and say, what's the total quantity of everything in this particular transaction? Uh, the total quantity is going to be five plus one plus two. So you're adding everything in the quantity column. If I go and ask, what's the total cost of everything in this data set? It's everything vertically. But if I want to go and ask, well, what's the average, what's the price per fruit? It's a row level calculation because I'm just doing it on the row. So hopefully that explains to you the importance, because if you start doing averages and calculations, and you don't understand whether they're happening at the row level or at the data set level where you're aggregating everything up, you're gonna get completely the wrong answer, completely the wrong answer. And it really depends on the question you're asking. And so how does this look on, like in Tableau? Well, if I go back to Tableau, you'll see here, and let me just comment this. And to comment a calculation, I can just do this. First of all, let me make it larger. So this is a, uh, da, 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 da. if I do forward slash star star backslash, I can add a comment. So this is a aggregate calc, okay? Whereas sales multiplied by 1.2 is known as a row level calculation, okay? So row level calculation is going to be on each row doing this maths. And then if I decide to aggregate this up, it's gonna be adding that all up. Whereas an aggregate calculation will first add all the cells up, then multiply it by 1.2. It's a subtle difference, but it means radically different things depending on the analytics questions you're answering. And so this, this takes a little bit of time to explain for new users, but the best thing the best thing I can sort of explain to you is, look, if you're doing some maths and you've got your calculator and it doesn't seem right, don't just take the visualization for granted and assume it's correct. Actually, get a calculator out, especially if you're new to Tableau. Just have a calculator on your phone and do the maths yourself to make sure you're arriving at what you expect to be the answer. I can't tell you how many times I've sort of gone back and forth with a client or with anyone who just you're just basically making sure that you're calculating the right average at the right level of detail <laughs> to come to the right answer, yeah? Uh, in, in some organizations, they even have weird ways of doing averages. For example, they won't do the average across the whole data set. They'll take the average of the average in some cases for different business units because that's just what they've done, even though that's not necessarily correct. So that's another sort of example to watch out for. The other thing to note about calculations is you've got this little arrow that some people don't realize allows you to open an external window, which gives you all the documentation on additional calculations. And it's just like Excel. In Excel, you kind of get these sort of groupings, number, string, date, type conversions. And um, all of these are pretty well thought through. The reason I won't cover these in now is because, uh, surprise, surprise, you know what I'm about to say. I have a whole playlist on this. So. If you go to YouTube and go to just my channel, not my live stream, and go to playlists, why can't I find this? Oh, there it is. YouTube keeps changing the interface. All right, there we go, Tableau Functions. So if I go to that specific list, okay. there we go, and um, there's a playlist. So I have um, 23 videos covering all the functions in groups and individually as well. So um, you can see some of these are 30 minutes long just on that function or just on that group. 
So um, if you added all these up, it's easily longer than even this crash course. So go ahead and check out all these functions. You can kind of get a sense for the crucial ones to watch because you can see by the view counts that those are the ones that most people are watching. So if you're not sure what to do, just go. I think if you do it in from top to bottom, it's got the most recent ones at the top. And then if you go down, you can see these are the ones that don't matter so much because they don't get used that much. But um, the ones that get used the most, people search for the most, are these ones at the top. So learn those, get comfortable with them, and then you're pretty much good to go. Okay? Good. Right. The very final thing we need to do is put our dashboard somewhere for people to see. Now, if you're using Tableau Creator, as we covered right at the beginning, what you have access to is Tableau Cloud or Tableau Server to publish up this workbook. So to do that, if you just go to the top and select Server and sign in, you should get an option to sign in at some point. <laughs> Maybe today is not it's not playing ball. So maybe what I'm going to do is I'm going to force it to kind of hurry up a little bit by selecting Publish Workbook. There we go. And I don't actually want to log into my work server. I want to log into Tablet Cloud because that's the server that I'm going to be using today. And so you just enter your details. And that has worked or hasn't it worked? That has worked. We can see the spinner is coming up. There you go. And you've got uh, default. I've got the name live stream, which is what I'm going to use. Um, the projects are just folders on your Tableau online website. So you will typically be told where to publish. If you don't know where to publish, ask someone who's already in the organization and they should be able to tell you which of these folders you're going to be publishing to. Folders in Tableau's world and also known as projects. So that's basically all you need to know about that. The default folder should not be visible to you. If it is, you need to talk to your server admin and just sort that out, okay? <laughs> Don't tell them. It's just not good practice to have the default folder visible because the only reason the default folder exists is because it acts as a template, not for people to actually put content in. So you want to make sure you're publishing to something else. So I'll select 90 cells. Um, I'll give it a name, live stream 8th of Jan. Okay. You can give it a description. This will show up. And um, if you don't want to publish everything, maybe you only want to publish the dashboard. You can see here that I can hover over and I see all the different charts that I have access to, and all of them are ticked. If I go down here and I select only dashboards, you'll see that it deselects pretty much every single one and it only ticks the dashboard, which is right at the bottom here. Okay. Now, when you publish up, it takes everything in the workbook with it. So even though the dashboard is the only thing that shows, when you go to edit it, or when you download it and then edit it, Everything is still going to be this. It's not that you're not. It's not that you're deleting these. You're just hiding this from being visible on the server. But they're still there. They're just not visible to you. anyone other than the author. So my first dashboard, that's all done. Um, you can play around with permissions. Again, I've got a video on that. Uh, data sources, uh, I've got a separate video on that. So I'm not going to go too much in depth on those. But this is the basic uh, publishing settings. In the latest versions of Tableau, there is something called the Workbook Optimizer, which tells you how to improve performance on your dashboard. And if you go to that and you expand it, you'll see that it tells you a little bit about what you could do to improve your data source. If you're a new user to Tableau, don't worry about these right from the get-go, because they might do things that you don't really want to do. But it's a great way to start learning about what the implications are for each of these. And Tableau has a nice link on the end of each one of these that tells you why that specific action is actually a good thing to go and um, you know do. So if you click on learn more, it takes you off to a, 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 an instruction. And actually, in the latest version of Tableau, you've got the ability to take action just by selecting one of these two icons. Okay. So if I just go ahead and select publish, we're going to ignore these uh, errors. It brings this window back up. We can go ahead and select publish. It will say for this workbook to be scheduled or refreshed, it must have embedded credentials. Um, and essentially, I'm just going to try and embed everything because I connected to a server to connect to Snowflake at the beginning of this. It's going to go ahead and get my details and put it inside of the workbook. So for now, we'll just click yes. Change. Let's try it one last time. If it doesn't work, we'll just have to. I'll probably have to edit this video and put <laughs> put a working publishing demo and just assume there's some sort of bug going on at the moment with Tablet Cloud. So. I'm going to the 22.4 demo. Uh, we're going to call this live stream 8th of Jan. Uh, we'll publish this up. Uh, everything's included in the workbook. Still the same error. I don't know what's going on there. 
Um, the only thing I can think of, let's try one last thing. I'll open up a, uh, oh, we already have a workbook uh, running. So this is another workbook that I set up as a sample workbook. I'm just going to show you the publishing working, hopefully. So this is another computer, another workbook. I am logged in as the same user. So let's go ahead and we'll try and put this in 22.4, everything as is. Go ahead and hit publish. And you see it works this time. So what must be happening is I have an issue with my Mac. That's the only difference between these two. That's the only difference between the settings. And that issue has meant that I'm essentially seeing a bug when I go up and publish because um, Mac OS Ventura is not officially supported by Tableau. And on top of that, M1 Macs are not officially supported by Tableau. So for that reason, that's why this, this sort of came up. But if the publish works, you should just literally get an exact copy of your workbook shown up on the browser. You'll see each of the tabs, and now you're pretty much good to go. You can now share the link to this particular page, or you can go off and share this with other people and get it to work. Okay. Good. So um, Diablo, thanks for <laughs> thanks for <laughs> googling a little bit. Um, the the reason I have this backup set up here, if I go back to this workbook. Um, it's exactly the same login. You can see that it's the same user that I've got on uh, this this workbook. So going into the same server, exactly the same setup. Um, the uh, data sources are embedded inside of this particular workbook. So again, there should be no issue with them just sort of going up with the server. But I think the issue is to do with my version of um, Mac OS. So I'm using 22.4, but I'm also on a Mac. Okay, and this version of Mac is not officially supported by Tableau at this current moment in state. And so that bug is likely some sort of incompatibility with the way it's working with the files or permissions or something. It's, it's just stopping it from sort of publishing it up. Um, what I might do in the edited version of this video is I might go back and re-record that without that sort of whole troubleshooting, but I'll leave it in this live live recording so that at least some people have the benefit. And then I can explain sort of what's going on. But it's a, an important thing to just bear in mind that <clears throat> if you're not using supported hardware, sometimes these things are just going to break. And um, yeah, but good thing I have a backup. <laughs> oh God, it's so typical. But anyway, there we go. You saw how to publish a workbook. Essentially, all you're doing is you're publishing it up so other people can see the work. And once it's been published, um, you can go ahead and, uh, you know, share it with people and they can start using it. Um, I have another video that explains Tableau Cloud and Tableau Server already, so I won't do that here. Um, but this is essentially what it looks like. This is how you share your visualization. It gets put into a folder amongst other visualization and bits of work. And when people go and click on it. This is what they sort of arrive at and they can go in and start using it uh, as a dashboard. And they can just sort of carry on and work with it. Okay. Now, the other thing I wanted to show you is how to publish to Tableau Public, okay? Because Tableau Public, um, uh, yeah, one, what I wanted to do is show you how to do Tableau Public because Tableau Public is probably what you might be using to get, get like a free um, uh, use of Tableau. So you might want to publish your work there instead. So to do that, what I'm going to probably need to do is we're going to need to build a very, very quick chart. So you're going to kind of see me speed building here. So we're going to build a chart very, very quickly. And for the record, I've been using Tableau a while, so what I'm doing here very quickly is just me trying to kind of get through this. But once you start to use Tableau a lot, you'll get very, very familiar with how to use Tableau, and it will become like muscle memory. So we're going to connect to orders. Once that's there, we're going to go to sheets, and I'm going to create a city map. We're going to put uh, sales on size. It's going to complain a little bit about the... Um, um, man, it's really slow today, isn't it? Look at this. And my computer is my computer is not a slow computer either. It's, uh, <laughs> we'll put cells on size. We know the geographies are wrong, so let's go ahead and create that and fix that quickly. Uh, this should come from country and region. State and province should come from state and province, and that should go ahead and fix everything. There we go. Size. We'll bring this right back up. We'll give that a nice white border. Excellent. That's our first chart. Uh, we'll go bring a line chart. We show cells over time. I want this broken down by month. There we go. 
And then I'll go build a table showing us the cells for each quarter. I'll go ahead and put that in the text. And we want this to be broken down by subcategory. And I'd like this to be a square filled and then we can put profit on color. You'll notice that kind of broke along the way, but I was fine with what it was doing because I know where the end result is. So there we go. We built three charts very quickly. We'll get up a dashboard. Um, don't know why the dashboard is this size. This is such a random size. So, oh, it's because it's a range. That's why. Oh, who left this on range? I must have done a range myself at some point. Um, so here we go. We've got three sheets. I'll double click them, bring them in. This is a very nasty chart. So what we'll do is we'll, um, for this one, hmm, I think I'll put these two side by side and I'll take, get this to kind of sit on the edge and mm -hmm. we'll go ahead, delete the containers and delete everything on the side. We'll get this to fill the width. Okay. And uh, I'll maybe push this up and get it to fill the entire view. Let's see, can it do that? Yeah, there we go. So now we've got that. We can set these to be interactive. So now when I click on a data point, it filters the table. I'm able to click on bookcases and just filter this out by bookcases, okay? So really good basic chart. Now we're gonna publish this up to Tableau Public. You see when I go to server, there's no option to do that. So instead we go to file, save to Tableau Public. It's gonna ask us to log into Tableau Public, at which point I forget my Login for that. <laughs> so I'm going to immediately fire up one password. It might already be logged in. No, I uh, wishful thinking. So there you go. So it's logging in. Now we're publishing up to Tableau Public. It's going to ask me what I want to save it as. I can call this um, my first workbook. Hit save. And now it starts sending it up to Tableau Public. And when it's done, it will load up the web page. And unlike Tableau Cloud, it looks slightly different. And this is what it will look like. Okay. There you go. So there you go. It's your first workbook. Uh, you don't get all the security and the permissions that you get with Tableau Cloud, all the governance stuff. It's not there. If you want to edit it here, don't forget right at the beginning, I showed you that if you go to this icon up here, you can select edit and edit it in the browser without having to go back to edit it in the desktop, okay? And so you can change things around, change the titles, everything as you'd expect. Pretty much as I showed you, all the sheets are there and you can go ahead and sort of work with that, okay? So that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's um, how to go from zero to a dashboard to publishing it up on Tableau Public or Tableau Cloud um, or Tableau Server even, and yeah, you're pretty much golden. <laughs> Good. So yeah, I did. God, it took a little bit longer to get to the end of that, but we, we got there. Okay. So there we have it. That's the entire Tableau desktop crash course complete. This is the first one we're doing. We're going to be doing more on Tableau prep, Tableau cloud and Tableau service. So subscribe and stay tuned for those. We'll be doing those over the next few months. Uh, so check those out. Now, at the very beginning of the video, I hinted at something. I hinted at the idea of a full on proper course made by Tableau Tim. And in order for me to do that, I really want to collect a few bits of information about you, the audience. I'd love to know what do you really want to see in a course? And more importantly, there are also a couple of things I'd really like to understand about the individual countries and markets you're coming from. Obviously, I get data from YouTube, but when it comes to courses, I think you have to be more specific about why people are sitting in courses. Are they doing it for work? Are they doing it to uh, progress themselves professionally? Are they investing in themselves or is their organization going to be supporting them through this journey? All those things are things I'd love to know from you directly as my audience. And so I've put up this little form. It's still up on the screen as a QR code. It's gonna take you less than 30 seconds to fill it in. So please, please uh, fill it in. Let me know what you think. And there's also an option on there for you to let me let you know when I actually have a course available. So what will happen is whatever you tell me you're interested in, uh, if you tick the box to say, uh, let me email you when I have that available, I'll obviously be doing that as well. So bear that in mind when you fill in the form. Um, and the other thing I really want to know, the other thing I'd really love to get a better insight um, from the community is, is which 
Which other tools are you using alongside Tableau? That's also in the survey. I know Tableau is not the only tool used, but I'd love to know, are you using Tableau in conjunction with other tools? And if so, what would be the top of the list? I have an idea of what I'd put at the top of the list, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you guys are pushing the frontiers of what's actually possible with Tableau and pairing Tableau with things that I've never even heard of. So also in that form, there's gonna be a few options there to say what other technologies are you using with Tableau? And that might just inform what I think will be one of the best courses on Tableau that might, might just get built very soon. Let me know in the comments, let me know in the form, and hopefully I'll catch you in the next live stream or crash course that we do here on this channel. Thanks for watching. And as ever, we'll catch you in the next one.